What's up, guys? It's your boy, Omni Sensei. Welcome to What If I Was Reborn in Naruto as Shinobi with Gamer System. Part 5. Like, share, and comment on the video. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't subscribed. Also, remember to check out the original story. Link in the description. With all that out of the way, let's get into it. The roars of a humongous bear shook the air, while two giant wolves howled in defiance, and Daiki sighed. Typical, just typical. And Orochimaru was already on the move as well, his attack on Team 7 commencing. Daiki watched idly as thousands of feet away. Naruto was blown away from his teammates by a massively powerful squall of wind, sent spiraling through the air, deeper into the forest and was promptly swallowed by a gargantuan snake that would loom over even the 100-foot bear facing off against the two giant black-maned wolves. Why did the snake summons have so many huge, boss-sized members? Daiki shook his head and put Team 7 out of mind for now. Orochimaru wasn't going to kill them, and he had a little bit of time anyway. His eyes drifted to the fight going on between three giant forest beasts. The male of the pair rushed the bear from the front, going for its neck, only for the bear to rear up on his hind legs, towering far above the wolf and slamming a razor-clawed paw into its cheek that bodily lifted the huge wolf up off the ground and smashed it through a massive tree that was easily a thousand feet tall. That bear had some serious power to it. But the wolves were cunning, because the frontal attack distracted the bear, long enough for the female wolf to get behind it and sink her fangs into its lower back, where its spine would be. She was trying to paralyze the bear. The bear roared and swung around bodily, yet the wolf had latched her teeth into it so tightly that she was bodily picked up and swung around by the bear as it moved. Realizing it couldn't reach her with its arms, the bear thrashed around wildly, trying to dislodge the female wolf, only for the male wolf to come bounding back out of the forest where it had crashed through the massive tree and leaped through the air, razor-sharp teeth glinting. The bear roared in pain as the male wolf gnawed into its side. But it seemed the bear wasn't stupid, either. It gave up trying to dislodge the wolves right then and there before throwing itself back. The female wolf whined in pain as the bear crushed her under its bulk. Her teeth came free and the bear stood back up and swiped down with both massive paws, grabbing the male wolf by the head and ripping it free from the bear's side, blood spurting in great rivets through the air. The bear lifted the wolf up by the head. Both massive paws clasped around its skull and squeezed. The wolf howled in agony. It was sad, but tactics, intelligence, and superior numbers couldn't always bridge the gap to allow one to overcome raw, unadulterated power. He could already see how this would go. The bear would crush the skull of the male wolf, killing it, leaving the female alone to fend the bear off. She would buy easy pickings one-on-one, -on -one, either killed or forced to flee and leaving the pups defenseless either way. This place was the law of the jungle, honestly, this entire world thrived on that aspect. It was just how the world worked. Daiki had long since accepted that and become part of the cycle. It was a dog-eat-dog -dog world. Yet he found himself leaping through the air powered by a shunshin all the same. He always was a dog lover. He shot into the air above the bear, before thrusting both hands up above him and firing off a pair of force palm jutsu from his hands jettisoning him down through the air like a bullet. He threw himself into a forward spin, picking up a massive amount of momentum and came down atop the bear's skull with the most powerful knee strike he could muster. A massive cracking sound resounded through the air and the bear froze, its paws going limp and dropping the male wolf to the ground, it landing on its feet in a daze. A moment later, the titanic bear teetered on its feet, before collapsing sideways. Eyes rolled up into the back of its skull, its sheer bulk making the ground rumble like a mini earthquake went off. Standing atop the comatose, or possibly dead bear, Daiki met the eyes of the giant male wolf that stared at him wide-eyed, shocked. Joined a moment later by the female, tenderly limping over to her mate and eyeing him warily. You're welcome, Daiki told them dryly, 
eyes glancing up into the tree line where the star team stared down at him absolutely wide-eyed. They promptly turned tail and fled. Daiki made a shadow clone. The clone immediately shot off into the tree line after them. Daiki eyed the pair of wolves, before sitting down on the bear's head cross-legged. Now that he looked at them, these wolves were kind of cool looking. When their pups grew up, they'd be a pack of six huge wolves of this size. Pulling a Kakashi and training these things to be Ninken, that would be a hell of a power move. Especially since, with their immense size, they'd be much more combat-able, and Packin took on Jonin in the other timeline. He didn't really need them for himself, but they could be a good gift for somebody and be a big help to him later through them becoming stronger. Who did he know that needed and wanted a summoning contract? Sasuke wouldn't need them, even if he didn't go to Orochimaru, he'd get his hands on the Hawk contract no doubt somehow and the Uchiha had access to the Cat contract as well. Hanabi already had her tiger, though he made a mental note to hunt down some more for her, get her a whole pack of M. Inada then? Or maybe Tenten? Yeah. Tenten wanted a contract, didn't she? Heck, he could probably pass the training of them on to her as well, since she had Guy as her sensei, and he'd be able to bug Kakashi into telling her how to train them into Ninken. Hey! Daiki spoke up, making the wolves tense up at his voice. It was kind of amusing. He held his hand up, and brought out one of the blank summoning contracts he'd made through clone labor. You know, I saved you guys here and now, but there's a bunch of these bears in this forest. What'll happen to you guys if you come across another one, I wonder? He almost felt like a skeevy car salesman. While the original Daiki was making a deal, his clone was in hot pursuit of the star team. Well, he said pursuit, but they were much, much slower than him. So he sped right past them, getting in front of them and cutting them off. Hello again. Daiki greeted them with a smile as they froze atop a branch before the one he was currently on. Arms crossed and casually leaning against the middle of the tree. How did Dash? The cute girl of the team. Hokuto if he remembered her name right froze and stared wide-eyed at him. I'm just that much faster than you guys. His smile turned into a grin. So you guys are from Hashigakure, huh? We are. The short purple-haired boy he remembered Naruto meeting as well confirmed. And you are Daiki Yuriai, right? He asked, hesitantly. Oh, you know of me? Daiki's eyebrow raised in interest. We overheard the other genin talking about you earlier during the first exam. He grimaced. We were hoping to avoid you, actually. Smart of you, he praised lightly. And it was, of course. The mysterious peacock method was a pretty amazing technique, but it was useless if they couldn't even get it up in time to block any of his attacks or hit him at all. It was why the grind was the true be-all and end-all base to all shinobi abilities. Without the physical ability to react in the first place, all jutsu and abilities were useless. At the end of the day, his eyes, his seals, his armor and all of his jutsu were mere supplementary support for the roaring power of his epic grind enhanced muscles. Speak for yourself. The third of their team, the only only Daiki didn't recognize snarled. He might be strong compared to others here, but compared to the power of our star chakra that all the villages covet, he's nothing. He clasped his hands together in a modified seal, index and pinky fingers extended and touching, forming a triangular shape, purple chakra flaring at his back like a powerful flame and the unnamed star Jenin gagged, eyes going wide with pain as suddenly, Daiki's fist was buried in his solar plexus. He contorted around Daiki's fist, before his wide eyes rolled up into the back of his head and he fell unconscious. Daiki pulled his fist free and let the boy drop to the ground unconscious, before pinning his body under his foot. It all happened so fast, neither of the other two had a chance to even see him move before the boy was already falling. Seiya! Hokuto gasped, but instead of rushing Daiki, she smartly leaped backwards her hands falling into the same hand seal, while the purple-haired boy leapt to Daiki's other side and did the same, enclosing him in from both sides and forcing him to pick a target and go for them while the other could attack from behind. Daiki didn't bother attacking either of them though. Instead, he activated the infinite armor on his shoulder and watched with interest as purple star chakra was drawn from the boy's body under his foot up into the mouth of the Isabu head armor. You're absorbing his chakra? Okudo gaped at him. Something like that, Daiki grinned at her, glancing her way. Thing is cute stuff that nobody really covets your little meteor thing. 
it's interesting and I could make use of your mysterious peacock method and plan to do so, but it's not all that great considering the drawbacks. He tilted his head, just in time to avoid a roaring flaming purple serpent of chakra aiming for the back of his skull. He of course didn't actually need to do so and was just showing off. He reached out and grabbed the serpent and pulled on it, hearing a yelp behind him. The purple-haired boy who cunningly took advantage of him turning his attention to his female teammate was pulled bodily through the air, and Daiki spun around, delivering a knee strike to his stomach. The boy gagged from the blow, but remained conscious surprisingly, he was sturdier than his teammate, or at least had much more pain tolerance. The follow-up elbow to his skull though, smashed the boy into the ground before the chakra on his back could be formed into a shape to counter, and he smashed into the tree branch unconscious, just like his teammate. A moment later, glowing ethereal purple ropes of chakra launched at him while he was busy with his real target of the three. Five of them in total aiming for his legs, arms and neck. As soon as the chakra was about to make contact with him though, the ropes lost form and broke down into raw chakra and was absorbed by his body armor. He directed the chakra into the infinite armor for safekeeping. Get away from them! Okudo snarled at him. Daiki looked over his shoulder to see that her star chakra had formed into a winged cloak around her body, and she shot towards him, shooting through the air like a bullet using the chakra wings. She punched out at him as she approached, the chakra coating her fist flaring out into a purple chakra claw, smaller, but akin to the ones he could use in his Jinchuriki cloak, which was promptly devoured by the infinite armor. Hokuto's eyes widened and she flipped around just before she reached him, and lashed out with a flying kick aimed for his face. The infinite armor slurped up the chakra around her foot, but it couldn't do anything about the physical kick, packed with quite a bit of momentum from her chakra-enhanced flight path. Huh, she was pretty smart. It was just too bad for her that he was rather proud of his physical strength. He caught her kick on his forearms by placing them over one another in a cross block. The force of her kick still managed to force him back a step, which was good on her though. Hokuto's eyes widened as he grabbed her foot she quickly made that hand seal she and her teammates used to initiate their jutsu and purple chakra formed into ropes on her back a moment later and lashed out at him, only to be devoured by his armor. Then with his grip on her foot, he pulled and spun around, before slamming her into the, the heartwood of the tree. The bark cracked from the force of the slam and Hokuto cried out in pain, before slumping to the branch base he stood on as he let go of her. So you're the strongest on this team, huh? Daiki mused, he hadn't been expecting that. But then again, one of them was a no-name and the other he remembered having his body give out beneath the star chakra training, while Hokuto herself seemed to be going strong. Either way, he'd seen enough now to get a good feel for how they manipulated their star chakra. He had a good idea how to go about recreating the mysterious peacock method now, once he got around to actually using the chakra himself. The first was already at the barest amount of chakra left before chakra exhaustion. So Daiki left him and turned his attention to the dull purple-haired boy. He had the highest and purest concentration of the star chakra due to it polluting his very body. W8! Hokuto gasped from behind him, stopping him in his tracks. He looked over at the girl to see her feebly reaching into her equipment pouch and pulling out a familiar light-colored scroll. If... If I give you our heaven scroll, will you leave us alone? That was the smart move to play right now. Offering him the target of the exam and giving up her team's chance to pass in return for him leaving them alone. Sadly for her though, I've already got what I need to pass, Daiki shrugged. I targeted you guys specifically because I wanted to get my hands on some of your star chakra. Like I said a minute ago, I can make some decent use out of it. But don't worry, I'm not going to kill you guys or anything like that. Honestly, you should be thanking me. Hokuto gaped at him. Thank you, for attacking us? More or less, but more on the side of me saving your teammate's life. Daiki grinned at her and reached down, grabbing the purple-haired boy by the collar of his jacket and lifting him up. After all, that special training you guys do around your little meteorite back in your village? It's killing you guys. He revealed, before reaching over with his other hand and pulling up the boy's jacket to reveal his lightly muscled, yet rather thin torso, and the deep purple glowing flame-like markings spread all over his stomach and chest. What is that? The older girl went wide-eyed, before biting her lip, coming to a realization herself. Is that, 
Star Chakra? It is, isn't it? I can feel it. There's a reason your third Hashikage band, the star training in your village, you know, Daiki helpfully informed. It makes your chakra much stronger and grow rapidly, but in the process, most of you going through the training will die, these markings on his body. It's chakra poisoning, specifically a poison known as radiation. The effects of the star seep out of your chakra network into your body and attack your organs, cells and such. Even on the one in a thousand chance you survive the training your lifespan will be drastically cut short and you could die at any time. Hokuto stared at him for a moment, before swallowing heavily. If it's like that, then why do you want our chakra for yourself? She questioned. She was probably looking for any fallacy in his words, a way to deny his words. He couldn't exactly blame her, after all he was basically telling her that their current village leader was putting them through training that would kill most of them. Because I'm amazing, Daiki shrugged. I've developed a special little seal that will filter out the radiation poisoning from the star chakra, purifying it and making it safe for me alone to use. That? Hokuto bit her lip, shaking her head. How do you know all this? Why did you make a seal like that for our star chakra? How long have you been planning this? Again Daiki shrugged. Actually, the seal was made for something else. You guys just popped onto my radar when I saw you were here. Nothing more, nothing less, he replied. As for how I know all this? Information is power and let's just say that I've got some very useful spies that report to me all manner of things like this. This isn't fair at all. Hokuto sighed in defeat, slumping against the branch, a bemused smile splaying across her face. Life isn't fair. Daiki shrugged and proceeded to drain the chakra from the boy in his grip. He drained the boy right to the point before chakra exhaustion, and he watched as the glowing purple markings from the chakra spreading out through his body faded away before letting the boy go and letting him slump to the tree branch again. Clearly, she groaned. What am I even supposed to do with this? How should I know? Daiki raised an eyebrow. It's not really my place to help you. Hokuto grimaced at his words, before gritting her teeth and forcing herself up on shaky feet. That seal you have, would it be possible to trade for it? She asked. Daiki paused. Now there was a thought. He really only planned on using it for himself, but it could be very useful to have Hashigakure indebted to him. They didn't really have anything of worth beyond the star itself though. And if she brought up what he revealed to her, to the people of her village, especially that stand in Hashikage, she'd most likely be branded a traitor to her village. But if it went that way he could work with that as well. A whole minor village able to use the mysterious peacock method freely would be very nice to have to help later on. But a single Kunoichi amped by the full star itself, who was indebted to him, might be even nicer. Hmm. How about I give you the seal, and you can show off how it works back at your village? Daiki mused. If your village is interested, they can get in contact with Kanoha and we'll work out a trade deal. Hokuto blinked. You do that? She asked, surprised. Daiki shrugged. Think of it as a little bit of repayment for me getting rough with you guys and taking your chakra. He replied, rather gracefully if he did say so himself. Uh... Okay. The older girl nodded, before smiling brightly. So then, how do we do this? Daiki resisted the urge to smirk. It'll have to go on your torso, so you'll have to take your top and any underwear you're wearing there off. He replied. Hokuto's pretty indigo eyes went wide and her cheeks flaming red. Oh. She uttered, surprised. There was a smile on the original Daiki's face as he left the newly formed black maned wolf summoning clan to enjoy their massive bear meal together. It was surprisingly easy to get them to agree to the summoning contract, and now they would become much stronger and smarter in the future because of it and that wasn't taking into account them possibly getting Ninken training in the future. Now, he found himself playing spectator to Sasuke versus Orochimaru. Naruto had already returned saved them and got his butt beat and was currently hanging like a rubbish bag pinned to a tree. He blinked, a rush of memories going through his mind suddenly and he groaned, palming his face as blood rushed south. He could see in his mind's eye, Hokuto, the cute older brown-haired girl, topless, fair-skinned, round perky breasts a bit larger than a handful, capped with rosy little nipples, how they felt in his hands as he moved them to apply the chakra filter seal correctly. 
and the taste of her lips as he stole a cheeky little kiss from her once he finished applying the seal. Well, at least he had quite a decent amount of star chakra to start with now, and he could definitely understand what his clone planned and passed on to him. But, he put that out of mind for now and focused on the fight going on. It was dwindling to an end now. He watched as Sasuke bound Orochimaru to a massive tree with shuriken and ninja wire held between his teeth and ran through a few hand seals. This was it. In less than a minute, Orochimaru would give Sasuke the cursed seal. Such a useful thing that he had no chance of recreating on his own, not without Yugo's DNA. Honestly, the cursed seal itself provided a lot of benefits. Not only did it automatically draw in natural energy, allowing it to be passively collected and would allow someone to basically stay in sage mode as long as it was active, it also bestowed upon the user a sage transformation like Yugo's. And if Kabuto was anything to go by, both nature chakra style forms stacked together. He kind of wanted it himself. The only problem was dealing with that shard of Orochimaru's that was contained within the seal. You wouldn't need to worry about that though, Isabu piped in. To do it like that, the soul shard would have to enter your subconscious, which while for some people would be a very big issue, is a moot point for you when I already live in your subconscious. If you want that seal, then get it. I'll destroy the soul shard. Daiki froze. Are you sure about that? Daiki asked, voice serious. Because if so, that changed, while not everything, a hell of a lot. Shiromori and the Chameleon Clan could not teach him Senjutsu. It was one of the first things he'd asked. Shiromori himself was capable of using Senjutsu, but that had nothing to do with his Chameleon Clan, and more to do with his father Manda's side, the Snake Clan. He did not so much as learn Senjutsu as he survived it and gained access to it, after all, the way one learned Senjutsu with the snakes was not through training or being taught, it was through being bitten, injected with Senjutsu. Venom itself, for a lack of a better term, surviving and adapting. Shiromori didn't have the slightest idea of how to go about teaching him how to feel nature energy. So, unless he somehow got the toads to teach him, learning Senjutsu was all but impossible for him. But, the curse seal drew in nature energy. There was a slight possibility he could use it in the place of the toad fountain oil Naruto used, expose it to his body long enough and train to feel the energy itself. For all intents and purposes, the cursed seal of heaven would be a stepping stone for him to create his very own variation of sage mode. Not toad, not snake, and not whatever the hell Hashirama Senju lucked into. You're the one well versed in seals, Isabu replied. You should already know what happens when a living, conscious being is stuck inside a seal on someone. The subconscious acts as a bridge of consciousness for all attached to that body, and from what I gather, this Orochimaru uses to invade the bodies of others, he attacks and wrestles control of their subconscious and from there, subsumes them. Daiki nodded along in agreement. That did check out. Maybe if the seal itself wasn't connected to anything, it would be different, but when it was applied to the chakra of the holder itself, the physical and mental spiritual energy of the holder, it would have a direct link to the subconscious, and made a lot of sense on why Orochimaru wouldn't mark a Jinshiriki like Naruto. To be perfectly honest, if Daiki was in Orochimaru's place, he would have marked Naruto, killed Sasuke, took his eyes, took over Naruto's body and implanted the Sharingan in that new body. The drain from the Sharingan wouldn't be anything of note at that point at all, not in an Uzumaki Kyuubi Jinchuriki, born to the previous Uzumaki Kyuubi Jinchuriki and a massively powerful Kage father, having been exposed to the chakra of the Kyuubi itself since the very second he was conceived. Really, the only reason Naruto ever got exhausted at all early on, was probably more due to most of his chakra always being used to reinforce the 8 trigram seal itself and him only ever actually having access to a fraction of his total chakra, like 20% at best. Really, if there was any living person whose body he would take, it would be Naruto's. And Orochimaru wasn't an absolute retard. Most of the time. The only reason he wouldn't go for such an absurdly amazing body, would be if it was impossible. Because Karama would splatter his little soul shard, he was a pretty possessive guy like that after all. Despite his hatred currently of his situation, Naruto was his host. That went to the point where Karama would refuse to let Naruto have Fukusaku gather nature chakra for him as well. And he did, even at this point, deep down have a begrudging respect for Naruto. Because give the guy some credit, despite all the crap he went through with the village, abrasive as he could be, he was a generally nice, compassionate dude and he didn't let himself get weighed down like some whiny little biatch. It didn't matter how many times his face was forced into the dirt, 
How many times he was kicked down and mocked, he always got back up. Daiki had to respect grit like that at the very least. Sasuke, in contrast, really wasn't anything all that special, not without taking into account him being a transmigration of Indra. As far as talent and ability went, compared to Madara, Itachi, Shursue, hell even Itachi's cute girlfriend Izumi who'd had her Sharingan since birth and was a taijutsu prodigy that would make Guy weep in awe, Sasuke really just didn't compare. Naruto himself even was much more of a prodigy than Sasuke in Daiki's opinion. If that dude had someone willing to teach him from the get-go, the kid would have long since surpassed Kakashi even at this point. Sasuke, after all, grew up with a father who, while distant, did actually teach him, and Itachi, while busy a lot, did teach Sasuke as well. That, and the fact that teachers in the academy positively mooned after the guy and all ignored Naruto, even Iruka initially for the first few months he taught the class, showed how untalented Sasuke actually was. Ironically, pure talent-wise, Naruto was more like Indra and Sasuke more like Ashura. It was just the situation around the pair that made it seem like it was actually the other way around. Daiki slapped his cheeks. I'm getting off topic. He scolded himself, before shooting into the trees in a blur of speed. He'd wasted a whole two seconds on that thought tangent. He really needed to work on his inner monologues. You do seem to like the sound of your own voice and reinforcing how you see the world to yourself. I'd say it was an identity issue, but let me be honest, you're just a bit of a narcissist. Isabu added his two cents. He was actually quite okay with that. Better a narcissist than someone who lacked belief in himself. Daiki replied, drawing lightly on Isabu's chakra, just enough to change his eyes and not draw on a cloak of chakra. Despite how little it was in contrast to the full thing, his speed increased noticeably, as if he was using the body flicker to speed up. There was about two miles of distance between him and his targets when he started moving. At his full current speed, he crossed that distance in less than 10 seconds, even without a straight path to follow. Orochimaru gave him plenty of time to arrive. The man had far too much fun playing with his prey. The Sanin himself so invested in his target, and with Daiki hiding his chakra using his eyes, didn't notice him arriving at all. Sense power in your eyes that surpasses even Itachi's. A silky, sibilant yet soft-spoken voice echoed powerfully through the forest. My name is Orochimaru. If you wish to see me again and gain true power, then survive and pass this exam, Sasuke Kuen. Daiki's eyes landed on his own target as he spoke. The face he wore, half melted, displaying slitted yellow snake-like eyes and a chalk white pale face. Orochimaru formed a one-handed ram seal and opened his mouth, his fong-like teeth growing noticeably, before his neck stretched and launched through the air so fast. Daiki wouldn't have even been able to track without the Shinkigen and Isabu's chakra enhancing him. Good thing Daiki was already preparing, spreading his chakra out and running through a few hand seals. The instant his neck reached Sasuke and his teeth were about to make contact, there was a puff of smoke, and in Sasuke's place was Daiki. A sharp pain lanced up through his neck, while Orochimaru blinked in confusion for all of a microsecond, before his eyes widened in shock. The confusion lasted long enough for Daiki to elbow the man in the face, dislodging his teeth from his neck. You! Orochimaru hissed, before his eyes seemingly widened even further, to the point where they looked like they would pop right out of his socket. Rinnegan! Daiki! He heard Sasuke shout as well and saw his friend staring down at him from his previous position on a branch fifty feet up. Sharingan eyes wide in shock. Daiki would have loved to to smirk and give him some arrogant line, but he couldn't, because that was when he felt it. He felt the seal form on his neck and something spread out through his body, into his coils, and felt as his chakra coils were forced to take it in. Felt as they were stretched out, wider in a sense to accommodate growing, strengthening. Oh, I forgot something he realized in that moment. He'd forgotten just how much pain the seal itself caused when it formed. Daiki hunched, bent over and roared as liquid pain, like lava coursing through his veins, assaulted his senses. Instant regret. Isabu rolled his singular eye as his Jinchuriki screamed bloody murder in his head, keyword being inside. He was putting up a tough face and just making roaring, shouting, angry sounds on the outside. That cool, composed badass look he projected all the time to the other humans had to be the biggest lie of the century. He was a complete idiot of the highest order. But he was an amusing idiot. And 
That idiot, despite all his boasting and continuously growing arrogance, was his idiot friend. It had been a long, long time since he'd had a friend. In fact, had he ever had a pure friend? Even his caretaker's task to watch over him as a youngling, more treated him with awe and careful respect because of his father. And even his siblings weren't the most affectionate. If Isabu had his way, he'd take the fact he actually deep down liked Daiki calling him Isobro to the grave. And he couldn't say that Daiki didn't make life amusing as the very least. I suppose I should do my part then, hmm? The turtle Bijou mused lightly to himself, his eye landing on a small blurry humanoid figure forming bit by bit within Daiki's subconscious. It hadn't been hard to track it down. After all, its chakra was more than enough to stand out when the other chakra within here was his own and Daiki's. Sorry, but this is a one-room apartment, and I like my space. Isabu imparted on the fragment of Orochimaru, before bringing one of his shelled fists up into the air and bringing it down. He crushed the fragment of Orochimaru and forced his own chakra into it, breaking it down. He heard a scream of agony come from it, but ignored it. This man wasn't exactly deserving of pity or mercy. He seared the fragment's consciousness and body out of existence, breaking it down into pure chakra, before diverting it into Daiki's own chakra coils. It was a pittance compared to his own chakra capacity, but it would give a decent boost to Daiki's own capacity as it was currently. The pain was almost all-consuming, and he felt his consciousness begin to grow hazy. His coils felt like they were about to burst. He was dimly aware of a shout of worry, and then a hand on his shoulder. You! What the hell did you do to Daiki? That sounded like Sasuke. No, no, that is not the Rinnegan, it is close, but a slight difference, and why can I not sense his chakra? No, it is not important, Ringer indeed though. Orochimaru's sibilant voice distracted echoed before. Cuckoo, that is my gift meant for you Sasuke-kun. It seems your young friend tried to come to your rescue thinking it a threat to you, but no matter, I have enough stored still to form another, stand still now won't you? Like hell! Sasuke snarled. Fire style. Phoenix flower jut ga. The Uchiha gagged in pain. You are fast and skilled Sasuke-kun, but you are not ready for this stage yet. The same stage your brother stands on. Orochimaru's voice floated through his ears. Then, the haze on his consciousness suddenly disappeared and his eyes snapped wide open. The pain was still there, oh god was it still there, but there was also a rushing sensation almost like pleasure. It was power. His chakra coils and capacity erupted in size and scale, and he felt like he'd almost doubled in overall capacity. And that was before a new sensation spread out from his neck and encompassing his entire body. His chakra exploded out of his tenketsu in a spiraling, raging cloak of power that turned the very air into a vibrating maelstrom. There was one off thing about it, though. His chakra, it was dark blue in color usually. But not now. Now it had changed. A deep, royal purple with ebony black embers spread throughout it. Daiki felt amazing. He felt strong like this, incredibly strong. The power it gave him was almost akin to one of the tales of Isobo's full on cloak form. So this is the cursed seal of heaven. Daiki clenched his fist, before whipping his head around, banishing any stray thoughts immediately. Orochimaru pulled his fangs from Sasuke's neck, allowing the boy to drop to his knees and scream in agony as the seal seared itself into his chakra network, just like Daiki before him. Damn, he was too busy recovering to stop that. Oi, snake man! Daiki grunted. How peculiar. Orochimaru took his attention off of Sasuke and I Daiki. I cannot feel the connection to the seal on your neck, and you are using the power of it already. My, how interesting, how did you do it I wonder. Those eyes of yours perhaps. That his yellow eyes glinted with curiosity. Wrong. Daiki snorted, then moved. He disappeared in a blur of speed, and Orochimaru's eyes widened slightly in shock the pale man leaning back just in time for Daiki's knee to spear through the air where his face was previously. Daiki thrust his hand out, a quick force palm jutsu turning shooting him down onto the branch the man was standing on and avoiding the counter kick the man retaliated with. A sweep was stepped over, but Daiki spun through it, launching himself into a roundhouse that the man couldn't simply dodge with being so close and the sheer speed he was moving at. Orochimaru blocked the blow with a forearm, 
but the force of it sent him skidding back. This is not the speed and strength of a Jenin. No, this isn't even that of a typical Jonin. The man hissed in surprise. His surprise and curiosity left him completely open for the clone that burst out of the tree line behind him, bringing one of the sparking Kiba blades down through his head, cleaving him down the middle. His body burst into mud. Shadow clone Jutsu and Mai, are those the Kiba blades? Where did you get your hands on those I wonder? Child, Orochimaru hummed from above. His clone gave a yank on the handle of the blades, and they separated from his hands into the air, spinning like buzzsaws and generating a massive amount of lightning chakra and spread it to the clone as he ran through hand seals. At the same time, Daiki ran through his own. He was going big with this one. As one, they both snapped around to look up at Orochimaru. Ice style. Twin black dragon blizzard. Lightning style. Electromagnetic murder. Drawing on the chakra armor over his torso, Daiki punched out both fists, and from them, a pair of massive serpentine black dragons with glowing red eyes erupted, shooting through the air at Orochimaru. A split moment later, his clone thrust his palms out, unleashing a massive wave of crackling electricity, far bigger than he could generate on his own, encasing the pair of ice dragons in the current of electrical charge. Orochimaru, a testament to his status as a Sanin, leaped back blindingly fast and with a shocking distance. Daiki didn't bother directing the dragons to chase him. They slammed into the place where he stood previously, before erupting, exploding outwards into a truly massive hurricane of icy black, tearing trees decades old and thousands of feet high up from their roots and sending them flying through the air as if they weighed that of a feather. The expansion and size of the jutsu was so large, it spread out and subsumed Orochimaru before the man could react himself. Daiki would have got caught up in it as well if he didn't cut his losses and run. Using all his newfound speed, he had moved and retreated, and now found himself a good mile away, watching his jutsu roar toweringly high into the air. His clone landed beside him a split moment later, Naruto and Sasuke over his shoulders, while he had Sakura under his arm. Daiki, what how? Sakura sputtered, green eyes staring at him wide, awed, even a bit horrified. In the very center, at the eye of the tornado, Orochimaru lay limp, his body sizzling, smoking and charcoal, yet at the same time, frosted over. For all intents and purposes, he was dead. Not even he, a legendary Sanin, could take such an epically powerful jutsu and come out unscathed. Yet the body of the snake Sanin twitched, before its mouth opened and spread wide, and another Orochimaru pulled himself free, soaked to the bone, but otherwise fine. If I wasn't quick there with the replacement, I may very well have taken some rather gruesome injuries. The snake Sanin mused to himself, idly eyeing his shed skin. Those injuries would not have killed him, and his healing ability was such that he would have recovered from them. But, what an incredible jutsu! Orochimaru licked his lips. An ice-style dragon variation? Two at that, used in a combination lightning jutsu amplified by the Kiba blades. Kukuku. A ringer indeed Sarutobi sensei His old sensei was up to his old tricks, sending a little monster like that into the Chunin exams. And that was without taking into account the most interesting aspect of the boy. Those eyes, they were red initially, some form of Dejitsu Kabuto had informed him before. But then, those purple rings surrounding them, they looked just like the Rinnegan. Perhaps a precursor? He mused in thought. Like the Sharingan came before the Manjikyu Sharingan. Possibly? If so, it makes sense how he cut the connection Pain has a jutsu to absorb the very soul of a target through touch. It would make sense for the eyes that evolve into the Rinnegan itself to have access to such a jutsu. He thought. How fascinating. Disappointing in a way that his jutsu would be useless for taking such a body because of it, but fascinating nonetheless. Gara will not be enough for dealing with this one. Orochimaru crossed his arms. He would need to be dealt with some other way. Perhaps Kimamaro Kuen would be able to keep the boy busy? It would no doubt cost the leader of his sound five his life even if he did manage to win. But such was life. He paused as he felt a familiar chakra rushing his way, a smile blooming across his cheeks. Kuku kuku. Orochimaru chuckled to himself. Well, a teacher always has time for his first student, Noanko-chan? 
He had enough time to see how his old apprentice was doing these days, he supposed. Daiki stared out over the destruction his jutsu wrought, a frown on his face. Orochimaru was well out of range of them now. He could still see the man though thanks to the Shinkigan. He pulled that messed up replacement of his and got rid of the injuries on his body. He grimaced. It was freaking disgusting to watch a man regurgitate an exact copy of himself, then watch his original body melt into slime or something like that. But it was gratifying to know he was indeed capable of dealing such high amounts of damage to Orochimaru without slipping into his tailed cloak forms. Granted, that combination jutsu was probably the most powerful in his arsenal by a wide margin. It was a literal pair of lightning-enhanced ice dragons that exploded into a giant freezing hurricane after all. But, it was still very nice to see the fruit of his efforts. He's talking to himself, Daiki noted after a second. The snake Sanin was literally musing out loud to himself about Daiki. Granted, he was probably feeling safe that nobody was around him right now and had no idea that Daiki could hear him thanks to his eyes. He thought the Shinkigen was a precursor to the Rinnegan? Probably because of Isabu's eyes overlapping mine because I used some of his chakra. Daiki bit his lip. The thing was, Daiki honestly couldn't say it wasn't either. Because the Rinnegan was an evolution of the Sharingan. And the Shinkigen really did seem like a fusion of the Byakugan and Sharingan. It might very well be possible for his eyes to evolve into the Rinnegan. Then again, for it, I'll need the Sage's Chakra. Madara's eyes evolved from his own chakra mixing with Hashirama's. Enough chakra from Naruto and Sasuke might work, Titish. He cut his thoughts off as he heard the next words out of Orochimaru. Gara will not be enough for dealing with this one. Ah crap. Which meant the man had already decided that Daiki was someone he needed to plan around and have someone on hand to deal with him. That could range from Kabuto or Kimamaro, to the snake Sanin bringing some freaking crazy powerful dead Kage back with Edo Tensei and sicking him on Daiki. Sasuke-kun? Sakura's voice broke Daiki out of his observing the snake Sanin, as his Achiha friend, even unconscious, started to howl from his clone's grip. His clone looked him in the eye and grimaced. We need to go find somewhere for these guys to lay low for now, he said. Daiki nodded. Let's go then. He agreed. Jerking his head, Daiki beckoned his clone to follow him, before taking off through the treetops. Daiki, wait! Sakura protested from where he was carrying her. We need to help Sasuke-kun. And that crazy guy did something to Naruto as well. There's nothing we can do for Sasuke right now. Daiki shot her down instantly. As for Naruto, I'll take a look at him when we have a safe place for you guys. He'd been watching the fight from afar with his eyes, so saw how Orochimaru manipulated his chakra to use the five element seal. And if he examined it on Naruto himself, he was quite sure he could undo it. And perhaps learn how to apply seals with his chakra alone in the process while he was at it. What do you mean? Sakura asked worriedly. What did he do to Sasuke Kuen? And you for that matter, what is with those weird markings on you? And your chakra, it was completely visible a minute ago when he bit you. I've never seen chakra so powerful before. Just wait until she saw Naruto go into a tailed cloak for the first time then. It's a seal, specifically a curse seal created by Orochimaru. Daiki saw no harm in explaining it to her. He already had a few excuses planned for his knowledge on it now. It gives the user a power boost. In the process, Orochimaru uses the seal to make the user dependent on it. Addicted even, and then uses it to take over the body of the one he marked with it. Take... Take over the body? Sakura sputtered in shock. He wants Sasuke Kuen's body? Why? For the Sharingan, obviously. Daiki rolled his eyes. There's only two Uchiha alive now, Sasuke and his brother Itachi. And Itachi is too strong for Orochimaru to target with his seal and steal his body. So he came after Sasuke who's much weaker and more vulnerable. Oh! Sakura uttered, before pausing for a moment. Then... But wait! What about you? Can't he take your body now? And you still have those marks on you right now. He did indeed. Daiki was keeping the curse mark activated to get more of a feel for it right now. And just in case Orochimaru came after them again. If he did and pushed the issue, Daiki wasn't going to hold back. He was going to go full on full tailed cloak alongside the curse seal of heaven and mince meet him. Even if he had to tear down this entire forest to finish him off. It's a lot more complicated than that, Daiki explained. 
He basically puts a piece of himself in the seal, but I have a kind of special technique that let me kill it while it was connected to my body, so I can draw on the seal freely and use its power. Sasuke doesn't. That's why he's fell unconscious. Like a bloodline? The pink-haired girl asked. Something like that. Daiki evaded, pausing on a branch as they arrived in a wide clearing. There was a large tree with the base hollowed out, looking like a large cave opening and with enough foliage around it, that hiding there would provide enough cover to keep out of sight for the most part. The sound team were probably on the search for Team 7 right now as was their mission. Should I deal with them or let things play out? He wondered, hopping down into the clearing. He could deal with them easily. They were pretty trash to be honest. Even with their augmentations, they got held off by Sakura of all people for a time, even three on one. But it was a pretty pivotal moment, mostly for Sakura herself to shape herself up and take things seriously. You guys can rest here for now. Daiki told her as he landed and carried her into the tree hollow, followed by his clone who laid Naruto and Sasuke down gently. He set Sakura on her legs, but the girl's legs immediately went limp beneath her and she slumped to the ground. Eh, sorry. She apologized, giving him a brittle smile. I can't feel my legs, she admitted, a shameful expression appearing on her face. Thanks for carrying me as well even though I, you know, smell. He'd been ignoring the fact she reeked of piss. She'd wet herself in terror when Orochimaru unleashed his killing intent, which was actually still better than what Sasuke did. She at least managed to speak out initially and deride him for being a coward and spur his fighting spirit. Don't worry about it. Daiki waved it off, it didn't bother him, he was used to smelling worse. Like charred and crispy corpses and the dead that just voided their bowls. A little pee didn't faze him. Most would have the exact same reaction. Worse even in your place. He assured her. Not you though, she pointed out. Or Naruto either. I was completely useless during that fight. Say what you will about Naruto, but he's not a coward. Daiki smirked and decided to lighten the mood a little. And as for me, I'm just built different and I'm totally amazing. It's why I can compliment you on that perky round butt of yours and not be afraid of taking a punch to the face like Naruto if he did anything like that. Her cheeks pinked at his words, but surprisingly, she didn't glare at him. The pink-haired girl just sighed. You're a real pervert, huh? Sakura sighed, shaking her head. And to think, I thought you were actually real cool before. I'm the coolest guy there is. Way cooler than Sasuke for that matter. Daiki snorted, turning away from the girl and making his way over to the downed forms of Naruto and Sasuke. He met his clone's eyes and broadcasted a message straight to his mind. Go, make another clone and study the seal. He ordered. His clone nodded and promptly left the tree hollow and disappeared in a blur of speed. You wish you were as cool as Sasuke Kuen, Sakura refuted. Wait, where's your clone going? To scout the perimeter, he replied, crouching down over Naruto and lifting his jacket and mesh armor up and bearing his torso. Hmm. Blondie was decently ripped, was shorter, but stockier than Sasuke and had a noticeable six-pack. Good on him. And Sasuke isn't cool at all, hell he doesn't think he's cool. Only immature people find that whole silent, brooding, edgy thing cool. Hell, Naruto's cooler than Sasuke. He laughed lightly. Naruto was loud, proud and unashamed of who he was abrasive and annoying as he could be, that was way cooler than someone trying to be something they were not. Sasuke was only the way he was, because of his clan, he was nothing like that before. Sasuke was actually a shy little broken dork at heart. Sakura was struck silent by his words for a moment, and Daiki pressed his hand against Naruto's stomach, channeling chakra through his body and through the seal he knew was there. A moment later, the seal on his stomach appeared and Daiki actually found himself gaping at it in awe. Immediately he could see just from a glance that the 8 trigram seal was like a work of art. The idea behind it was, while not simple, something he should technically be capable of himself, it was a layering of two four symbol seals together to create an 8 symbol seal. But the sheer quality of Minato Namike's four symbol seals put his to shame. It was like comparing the Mona Lisa to a toddler's scribbles. And that was before going into how he merged them. In a way, it was akin to someone taking the Mona Lisa and the Last Supper and merging them seamlessly together, to the point where Mona Lisa was there, as a natural part of the Last Supper. It was an absolute beauty of a creation. 
beyond anything his current skill would even come close to allowing him to replicate. It was because of the sheer masterful artistry in the eight trigram seal though, that made the five element seal applied by Orochimaru onto Naruto's stomach stand out so blatantly. It was just so utterly crude in comparison that it really couldn't be hidden at all. It was literally almost appalling to Daiki's senses to see the seal on Naruto's stomach, besmirched by something of so low quality. He was affronted. Hell, it actually kind of made him angry. Somehow, he just noticed seals had become something that he'd begun to take pride in and respect the power and creation of. Maybe he should be a bit thankful for it, though. Because it was so crude in comparison, the mechanics of it stood out all the easier for Daiki to notice, especially since the seal was in effect. If he saw out outside of action and just how it was supposed to work, it would probably be a bit harder for him to decipher. Or he could just be reading too much into it. Orochimaru was clearly a hack when it came to the sealing arts. Complete poser. An utter plebeian. Let's try this out. Daiki thought, holding his right hand up, fingers set in a claw-like motion, and focused his chakra into the tenketsu on his fingertips. I'm immature? Sakura sounded ever so shocked behind him. Hmm, it was kind of interesting actually how carefree she more or less was. In the other timeline, she'd be worried sick about Naruto and Sasuke, standing guard over them while they rested until she was exhausted and falling asleep at her post. Here, she was much more relaxed. He supposed it was thanks to his presence. Dreadfully so in romantic taste, he absently replied. A light smirk appearing on his face and deciding to push her buttons a bit. Get her fired up. Physically, you've got a bit of growing to do still for sure. But that giant though, damn girl you got it going on. How am I immature compared to a complete pervert like you? Sakura goggled at him. Well, to be honest, I'm not a pervert. I'm just a connoisseur of the female form and am kind enough to share my wisdom with the world, he replied. You, on the other hand, think you're in love with Sasuke despite knowing nothing about him and have very immaturely deluded yourself into painting an image of him that is nothing like him. And where would you base that off of? Sakura sounded angry now. She began speaking again, but Daiki cut her off. All right then, here are two simple questions. What is Sasuke's favorite food and his preferred type of girl? These would be simple enough to hammer home what he wanted to say. What? Sakura stopped, confused before huffing. That's easy. His favorite food is red bean paste and he likes long hair girls. Wrong. So, so wrong. Daiki was actually surprised by her answer. So much so, he found himself laughing. Mostly because red bean paste is Naruto's favorite food alongside ramen. Sasuke's is tomatoes, and he doesn't have a hair length preference. He's just into older, mature girls, preferably with big tits. At the very least, he definitely noticed Hinata's tits and had paid attention to said subject when he brought it up during their training. He looked over his shoulder to find Sakura gaping at him emerald eyes wide, mouth hanging low. For the record, I do like long hairs girls and you have gorgeous hair, he complimented. He had nothing against short hair just had a preference for longer. It was good to hold on to, like a leash and all that. Right, this should do it. He thought a second later as he finished preparing the chakra in his fingertips. Dark purple and black chakra burned like embers over his fingertips and he brought it down atop Naruto's stomach, pressing against where Orochimaru's fingers had jabbed into him previously and injected his chakra into the seal, five element seal. Release. He manipulated his chakra through the seal and felt it click, unlocking and before his eyes it disappeared. A wide smirk appeared on his face. Get on my level snake scrub. Daiki smirked widely and wildly, bringing his fingers up and channeling chakra through his fingertips again and watching burning embers of chakra flicker over them. Through unlocking it, he'd learned everything he needed to apply it himself. Sasuke-kun likes big boobs. Sakura's voice murmured behind him, sounding horrified. He looked over his shoulder again to see the pink-haired girl was cupping her rather meager chest and looking rather lifeless. Oh right, she looked like the whole world was falling apart around her just from that little tidbit of information. Oops, Daiki honestly didn't know whether he should be flattered or not. That his presence here with Sakura and her unconscious teammates completely changed up the very feeling in the air around her. There was no desperate resolve formed here while she stood guard over her teammates to protect them. 
Because he was here, which he supposed made sense, Sakura after all, just bore witness to him driving off Orochimaru. Why would she have to fear any run of the mill genin coming for her and her teammates when he was around? He honestly didn't know if it was really a good thing or not. Sure, it was a pretty nice feeling for her to find him that reliable, but at the same time, was he not getting in the way of her growth? At the same time though, Naruto and Sasuke are already different from the other timeline. Both are stronger. Daiki grimaced a bit at the thought, because if anything, he thought that maybe Sakura was actually weaker than her counterpart. From what he gathered from Sasuke, Naruto seemed to be putting all his effort into keeping up, and they sparred constantly during team meetups with Kakashi overseeing them and taking up much of their training time there, leaving Sakura to the wayside. So Sasuke getting stronger from fighting Daiki all the time caused Naruto to get stronger as well trying to keep up, and they both had learned the Earth style. Barrier Jutsu, though Naruto seemed to be the one using it a lot and not Sasuke, Daiki had barely ever seen the Uchiha boy use the Jutsu. Kakashi, couldn't he like toss the girl a Genjutsu or something? Shaking his head, Daiki put them out of mind and turned around from Naruto and Sasuke and sat cross-legged in front of Sakura. Yeah, from what little I've managed to get out of him, he doesn't really care about hair length and has a preference for big tits, he said, before a thought came to mind of when he needled Sasuke a few weeks ago about any girls that caught his mind. The one name he'd let slip had quite surprised him. The only one he told me that caught his eye was a woman you guys met on your mission to wave, named Tsunami. At the time, when Sasuke revealed it, Daiki had gotten a real good laugh, teased the Uchiha about being a MILF hunter and everything. He hadn't gotten the joke until he explained what MILF meant to him. Sasuke then refused to speak to him for the next two days. Tsunami-san? Sakura's eyes went wide in shock and she sputtered. B, but she's in her thirties and has a child. There's a certain appeal to an older, mature woman, Daiki shrugged. More than one actually depending on one's general interest. But as far as Sasuke said, she was quiet, demure, was helpful and kind. Wasn't a bother like he claims you and Eno are whenever you gush over him. She apparently has some nice big breasts and is beautiful. A, a bother? Sakura repeated lowly, biting her lip. Sasuke Kuen had called her annoying before, a few times, less than a week ago even when they were given the registration forms for the Chunin exams. He called her annoying then, and claimed she was weak, far weaker than Naruto even after she asked him out on a date. That had stung fiercely, but now, she couldn't even deny it. Naruto had fought that Orochimaru off for a bit, even injured that humongous serpent he was riding on, before Orochimaru beat him down while she and Sasuke cowered from the man. Cha! I'll show him a bother! Her inner self raged. Sakura cringed, ignoring her. Her chest hurt, but she found she couldn't refute what was said to her. Sasuke Kuen more often than not turned up to their team meetings beaten, bruised and bloody, with a satisfied smirk on his face. From training with Daiki, Daiki was probably the person Sasuke Kuen was closest to, beyond maybe Naruto. As much as they argued, Sasuke Kuen and Naruto always seemed to be attached at the hip during team meetings and missions. She was always left behind. If Naruto didn't constantly pester her for dates and the new revelations she just got about Sasuke Kuen from Daiki, she might have suspected something more was going on there. Well, all that and she can cook as well. Sasuke seemed to think you're a horrible cook. Daiki shrugged and Sakura felt another metaphorical arrow pierce her chest. Just stick her over a campfire at this point, she was done. Though Sasuke's just into that traditional crap, being an Uchiha and all and honestly, I feel like a lot of the traits he feels are best in a woman are just because he idealized his mother. Damn mama's boy, cha! Her inner self spat. Her lips quirked for all of a second before she remembered how far that stacked the odds against her. Her breasts weren't going to balloon in size just because she wished for them to, though maybe she could change her attitude to be. Either way, romance is the last thing on Sasuke's mind anyway. Daiki broke her from her thoughts with a shrug of his broad shoulders. Besides, he has trash taste in women unlike me. The most I've seen out of you, in regard to romance, is you commenting on how much you like my giant. Sakura deadpanned. Daiki grinned at her, all teeth. You have a great giant, best of our graduating class. He unashamedly shot back. Besides, I'm pretty sure I complimented you on your hair and eyes as well. Despite herself, Sakura felt her cheeks heat up a bit at his blatant admission. 
You're such a pervert. She sighed, but felt her lips cork up just a little bit regardless. I just know what I like and I'm not afraid of saying so. The boy shrugged bluntly. He was like that, all up front and blunt, he had no tact at all in this case. But she couldn't deny that his words made her feel better, especially since Daiki was definitely very handsome himself. His was a handsomeness that was different from Sasuke Kuen. Sasuke Kuen was beautiful, a beautiful person if there ever was one, and had all the bearing of a tragic prince right out of a fairy tale. Daiki, on the other hand, he was broad and muscular, tall and strong. He had a wild air about him that just enhanced his looks, that all but screamed, Bring it on! As if challenging the world itself. Daiki was far more humble in his handsomeness, there was no doubt. But his muscles and frame aspired a sense of safety that she could see the appeal in, and he was far more raw than Sasuke Kuen, more open. If she had to compare them in just a few words, Sasuke Kuen was like a full moon reflected on a calm water surface while Daiki was like a gargantuan predator roaring his challenge to the world. Both vastly different, so different they couldn't even be compared properly, but yet majestic in their own different ways. And what you like is my giant. Sakura replied to him, forcing a deadpan look on her face. And the floor is made of floor. He snarked back, before suddenly standing up and making his way to the front of the tree hollow and peering out. Her heart almost leapt into her throat, are you going somewhere? Sakura asked, the air changing around them almost instantly. I'll have to soon, Daiki replied without turning around. This is an exam, you know? And beyond that, I need to make sure the Hokage knows about Orochimaru being here. Sakura froze. That was right, Daiki was part of the exam as well, he had to finish and pass himself. If he was stuck looking after them, he wouldn't be able to do so. And then there was Orochimaru, as he said. What about us? She bit her lip. If another team attacks, I won't be able to beat them and protect Sasuke Kuen and Naruto. You can come with me if you want, Daiki shrugged and looking over his shoulder to look her in the eye. But if you do, you'll probably be disqualified from the exam. Sakura froze. She personally wouldn't mind giving up here and now. There would be way more chances to become Chunin in the future. But what about Naruto? On Sasuke Kun? Would they see it the same? This exam was important to them, beyond important. Naruto needed to become Chunin and get stronger for that silly dream of his and Sasuke Kuen always wanted to get stronger and fight strong opponents. She didn't know why exactly, but she had an idea. My name is Sasuke Uchiha. I hate a lot of things and I don't particularly like anything. What I have is not a dream because I will make it a reality. I'm going to restore my clan and kill a certain someone. His voice drifted in her ears. From back then, on that very fateful day they became the three-man cell Team 7. Is this a choice I can make on my own? She fretted. This is your call Sakura, Daiki said. Sasuke and Naruto are down, so you're calling the shots here. If you want, I'll get you guys to the tower safely. It was all on her then. Suddenly, it felt like a heavy pressure was pressing down atop her shoulders, rooting her in spot. I... Her thoughts raced. Going with Daiki was the safe option. She would be safe, as would her teammates. She wouldn't need to worry. But Dash, I can't. I'll stay, she decided. Weak as she was, there were some things she just couldn't abide by or be cowardly about. And she couldn't trample on and betray the dreams and aspirations of her teammates. Oh, Daiki's eyebrows rose, and his eyes regarded her with an almost piercing look that she couldn't describe before slowly... A smirk spread across his face. Well, you definitely need a pretty sturdy backbone to carry all that giant around. She gaped at him, before growling. You pervert! Sakura huffed in accusation. The tense air was completely broken. Everything was really serious there. And then you bring it back to my giant, and you called it fat. Even, my giant isn't fat. Yeah, it is, Daiki shrugged unrepentantly. Or well, it's on the way there, which is great. A nice big round giant is great on a girl. A fat giant was a good thing for a girl? Anyway, if you're gonna stick around here, I suppose I can leave you with a little bit of help. Daiki mused, turning around fully and walking back over, kneeling down in front of her. Let me see your hands, I wanna try something. Why? Sakura asked, brows furrowing in suspicion. 
You're not gonna do something perverted, are you? Daiki gave her a dry look, as if she was the one that said something stupid here. You realize I've been playing it up, right? Because it gets a reaction out of you? He deadpanned before smirking. Besides, if I was gonna do something perverted, I'd have told you to turn around then squeezed your giant. Turn around. Let's see if he's all talk or not. Cha. Sakura sighed to think she really thought he was super cool before after he defeated Sasuke Kuen and during the mission to Waterfall. He was just a super strong, perverted idiot. All right, fine. She relented and held her hands up to him. Daiki rolled his eyes at her. I'm trying to do you a favor here, you know? He pointed out. Oh, right. She had forgotten. So caught up in the perverted banter he was unashamedly throwing around. Sorry. She apologized, face flushing. He just rolled his eyes again, before reaching over and placing his palm over the top of her right hand. She was about to ask what exactly he was doing, when she felt a warm, powerful chakra spread over her hand and saw a purple glow emanate from his palm. She felt something spreading out over her hand, threading between her fingers and going down into her palm. Daiki pulled his hand back a moment later, and to Sakura's astonishment, there was black markings over her hand now. It started at the back of her hand from a single diamond-like mark, branching out into multiple strands that looped elegantly over her knuckles, circled her finger bases and disappeared down into her palm, forming another diamond-like shape in the middle of it. What is this? Sakura asked. She knew it had to be a seal of some kind, which she had no clue. But since when could someone apply such a thing without ink of some kind? Nice! It worked! Daiki pumped his fist into the air happily. You know my force palm jutsu? He asked. Yeah! Sakura nodded, of course she did. It was what he used to defeat Sasuke Kuen. Yeah, well this seal will let you use a jutsu like that, you'll just need to channel your chakra through the seal I put on you to do so, Daiki informed. You aren't quite built like me, so I put it around your knuckles to use through a punch and make it easier on you. And you already know how to use explosive notes, so the trigger will be easy for you to get down since it's based on that. Sakura's eyes widened. You? Isn't that like your personal jutsu? She asked, shocked. And he was just giving it to her? She bit her lip, wanted to refuse the generosity. It was really too much. But forced herself not to. With Daiki's jutsu, she would definitely be able to protect them. For sure. Kind of, it's a bit different if the same applications, instead of the force palm jutsu, this would be the shockwave fist jutsu. Daiki explained, taking her other hand and repeating the same thing to apply his seal. Don't go using it willy-nilly though, your arms won't be able to handle the kickback, even I could only use it sparingly at the time I fought Sasuke back during that first time. Right now, a few uses of it will probably break your arms, so make it count. Sakura swallowed heavily, but nodded. All right, got it, the pink-haired girl said. She had to pick the time she would unleash the shockwave fist jutsu wisely, because she was too weak to use it properly without it being a double-edged sword. Moments later, he was done and stood back up, dusting himself off and preparing to leave. On instinct, Sakura wrapped her arms around the boy, hugging him. Thank you. She whispered gratefully, expressing her gratitude, not only for the seal and jutsu but helping them driving off Orochimaru and more. If he wasn't there, who knew what that freak would have done to them? It's fine, he waved her off. Besides, I've already got my payment in my palm. Sakura blinked in confusion. You're pay me? She eeped, not finishing her sentence as she felt his fingers cup her backside through her shorts. On instinct, she pulled away from him before growling and swinging a fist for his face. Righteous feminine fury driving her. Her fist met air as Daiki sidestepped and spun around her and she yelped, jumping lightly, an echoing clap resounding through the forest as his palm met her backside in a cheeky spank. She whirled around on instinct, only he wasn't there, and then she jumped as another spank clapped against her other giant cheek. Daiki! Sakura shouted, face burning red as she whirled around again. Only he wasn't there. Her hands went to her backside instinctively to protect it from another grope or spank. Only she felt nothing. Daiki's boisterous laughter echoed through the forest above. It seemed he had left. Sakura sighed. That damn pervert. She complained, shoulders slumping and sliding down to her knees. Despite that though, she found a small smile splaying across her face and she just sat there like that for a few moments, 
before remembering where she was and slapped her cheeks. Focus, I need to build some traps just in case. She told herself and the pink-haired girl forced herself to her feet. Daiki had a massive grin on his face as he sped away from Sakura and her unconscious teammates, ascending up higher and higher into the tree line out of sight. He stopped for a moment once he was out of her viewing range and eyed his hand, idly squeezing it and remembering the feel of her soft, pliable, perky giant and the way it bounced back against his squeezing and that jiggle it had. Damn just damn. For now though, I've got something important to do. He shook his head and continued on. He was making his way towards the clone he'd sent off a while back. The clone wasn't actually far off and just within the general perimeter and out of sight high up. He reached him just a few moments later, landing on the branch, finding his clone shirtless, with another clone having been formed and pouring over the cursed seal on his neck. Hey boss! He was greeted by a pair of nods. Daiki nodded back. Find anything? He asked. The non-shirtless clone grinned at him. Oh yeah, it wasn't all that hard to decipher, especially with what we know, he replied. I can see why Jiraiya and the like would have been confused though when they had no idea what Orochimaru was doing with the seals in the first place. Oh, Daiki hummed in interest. How so? The beauty of it is in how simple it is boss, his clone grinned wider as he began explaining. It's just like our four symbol seal, a seal specifically made to contain a chakra entity. The thing is, it doesn't even come close to the four symbol seal, it's completely trash in comparison, like, I bet even Gara's seal for Shikaku is better than this thing. On top of that, because the shard of Orochimaru was basically formed through Senjutsu, I'm thinking, nobody else could understand what was going on or do anything about it, barring maybe Jiraiya. Hmm. Now that he said it like that, had Jiraiya even looked at Anko's curse seal before? He didn't remember any mention of it or anything like that. Surely he did though, it would be stupid for him not to have been called in to do so. Then again, Jiraiya wasn't a master of Senjutsu either and had no knowledge of Yugo. So he could have easily just missed it all as well. Wait! Daiki blinked, a thought coming to him. If it's based on that type of seal can't we dash? Use the four symbol seal as a basis to upgrade it? His clone finished with a knowing look. I definitely think we can, and if I'm right, it should amp up the speed it draws in natural energy. And besides that, you're missing one thing as well, boss. And what's that? Daiki asked, raising an eyebrow in curiosity. Increasing the rate the seal could draw in natural energy itself was an amazing boon in of itself. The seal is empty now without the Orochimaru shard. His clone's grin turned wild, before he dismissed himself in a puff smoke. Memories submerged into Daiki's mind and his eyes widened as he learned all his clone had of the seal and the possibilities he had come up with. I see! His eyes lit up with realization. He could store the star chakra within the curse seal, after augmenting it with the four symbol seal and the chakra filter seal, and set it up to draw natural energy into the star chakra itself to help it grow and then filter through into his own coils like Isabu's chakra. Not only would that increase and enhance his chakra reserves, but drawing on the curse seal actively would give an even bigger boost. Especially if once he got his hands on it, he added the stone of Jellal in there as well. Laughter erupted from Daiki's throat and echoed ominously through the forest. Even as his first clone stood up and approached Daiki himself to help him with upgrading the original seal on his own neck. For all he made out that improving upon the curse seal was simple and not all that complicated sounding. It actually kind of was. Applying the chakra filter seal and four symbol seal wasn't a problem in of itself. It was connecting them to the curse seal itself that was and tidying up the connection channels. All in all, it took multiple hours of work to get it done. By time Daiki's clone finished up with the seal on his neck, the sun had long since fallen and they were into the wee hours of the night, or rather early, early morning. It was kind of boring actually. All Daiki had for passing the time was staring straight ahead, and while he could see the entirety of the forest in any one direction with his Shinkigan, there wasn't exactly much to focus on in the direction he was looking. Only Team 7, and they weren't exactly a barrel of fun right now. Naruto and Sasuke were still unconscious, being fretted over by Sakura, whom had, immediately after Daiki left them behind, began to set up traps. He couldn't even train his chakra control or anything like that, because the seal being refined was connected to his chakra network. Beyond that, 
the most entertainment he had was listening to the rumbling roars and snarls of the giant beasts inhabiting the forest itself and the screams of pain and terror of other competitors in the exam. He did get to see a Kumo team run into a pack of giant tigers, each not far off the size of the one he caught for his cute little apprentice Hanabi. They were torn to shreds and eaten up quite quickly. A pity they could have perhaps known some useful lightning jutsu for him to yoink, and they were the only Kumo team in the exam too. Such a shame and a waste. His clone clapped him on the back of the head. That's you boss, he said, before dissipating. The memories of the clone enveloping Daiki a second later, letting him know exactly what the clone did. Standing up, Daiki cracked his neck and grinned. Let's try this out then. He hyped himself up, bringing his hands together into a ram hand seal and focusing on the infinite armor on his shoulder. He focused only on the star chakra within it, and funneled it out into the air, holding it there, a sphere of light purple flame like chakra forming in the air in front of him. Then, he focused on the cursed seal, specifically one of the functions of the four symbol seal and chains of kanji spread out from the seal itself, enveloping the sphere of purple chakra and began draining it into the seal itself. In moments, it was done. The experience of sealing Isabu inside himself made this a simple affair. With the star chakra now within the cursed seal, Daiki drew on the power of the seal itself and felt as the power spiraled through his body, strengthening him. Oh, this is good. Daiki grinned widely, sharp teeth being bared to the world. He could feel a distinct increase in the power he gained from the seal straight away compared to how it was before. It wasn't quite double the gain in strength he gained using it before, but maybe half that if he was estimating, which was still a substantial boost. And the power increase wasn't the only thing to change. He knew after all, with the dits made to the seal, that the matrix appearance of the seal itself had changed, from three Sharingan-like tomos to three broad bolts of lightning. The second exam had not at all been going well for Kanoha Team 10. They weren't exactly the most combat-oriented team in the first place, so in general, their main plan of action was to hide out of view and ambush another team. Yes, that had been the plan. Until a massive, gargantuan black hurricane had ripped through the forest and rained strikes of lightning down all around as it passed by. The team they had been in the process of ambushing had been swept up and killed by the monstrous jutsu and their scroll lost in the process. Guys, there's that laughter again. Choji trembled. He couldn't at all tell where it was coming from. But that terrifying laughter. They'd heard it already multiple times today, and it seemed closer than ever, echoing all around them. Damn it, get down. Shikamaru crushed, grabbing his two teammates and pulling them down into some shrubbery to hide out of the way. Oi, watch my hair Shikamaru. Ino huffed, before looking around. Who the hell is this guy? Every few hours we hear him laughing. Who the hell would enjoy a place like this they'd laugh so much here? Never mind that. Listen to the laugh itself, Eno. This guy sounds super evil. Choji shivered. Just the sound of that laughing voice was so terrifying it put him off food. Hell, it was so foreboding. One team that had got the drop on them earlier outright got terrified and ran away even though they had them dead to rights. Eno, can you sense this guy? Shikamaru frowned and asked. He sounds closer than before. Annoying as it was, they mainly had to rely on Ino here, as a Yamanaka she was a natural chakra sensor, but relying on her so much had drained a lot of her chakra, so she was getting lower and lower without them having a chance to rest. Gimme a second. Ino brought two fingers to her temple and focused, closing her eyes. Only for her eyes to shoot wide open in shock a split second later. He's right above us! She gasped, looking to her teammates in horror. Shikamaru froze before sighing. Just our luck troublesome, he griped. Let's just hope whoever this crazy guy is, he isn't all that good at sensing. Oh man, oh man, Choji shook his head, before swallowing and crawling forward a bit to peek out of the shrubbery they were hiding in. We have to at least see who this guy is. He was stopped by Shikamaru blocking him. Wait, let me do it, he said, understanding. He was the best on their team when it came to stealth. Crawling forward, the pineapple-haired Nara got directions from his blonde teammate and poked his head out. Looking up, the Nara's eyes widened at what he saw. Oh, you've got to be kidding me. He groaned, the tension leaving him slightly at just whom he saw. What do you mean, Shikamaru? Ino hushedly asked. 
Take a look yourself, he replied simply. What? Eno furrowed her brows, before huffing and pulling her head out of the shrubs and looking up. Oh! Oh, H! Eno hummed, eyes lighting up. What, what do you see? Choji asked, curiosity getting the better of the big bone teen, and he stuck his head out, the same as his teammates, and looked up. Hey, wait! Isn't that Daiki? Yep! Shikamaru nodded. Hell yeah, it is. A wide grin spread across Eno's face. Mama likey what she sees. It was indeed their former classmate Daiki Yuriai, standing a few hundred feet above them atop a large thick tree branch. His torso completely bare, showing off his broad chest and muscular abs, with his powerfully burly arms crossed over his chest as he threw his head back and just laughed. So it was Daiki all along. Choji shook his head, a sigh of relief leaving him. He didn't exactly know Daiki all that well, they rarely spoke, but when they did, he was generally a pretty accommodating guy. A bit off though to see him like this, he tended to keep to himself a lot like Sasuke and Shino actually. Why the hell is he just standing there laughing and not wearing a shirt though? Shikamaru couldn't help but wonder. He doesn't need a reason to show off muscles like that. Ino scoffed. Who knew Daiki was so well built though? I'm sure I would have remembered someone like that at the academy. No. That guy's always been built like that, he wasn't as burly as he is now, but he definitely was always muscular, Shikamaru refuted, ignoring her admiration of their former classmate's muscles. Still, I don't think I'm wrong, he was the strong and silent type, remember? Standing around like this and just laughing out in the open, it doesn't feel like the guy we grew up with. Air, I mean, we didn't exactly know the guy that well beyond the academy, we only saw what he was like there. Choji pointed out, all the tension long since having left him at this point now that he knew it was somebody he knew that wouldn't just murder them for sport. He didn't really have any friends either. How about I go ask him? Eno piped in eagerly. And you remember what Kabuto said earlier, right? Daiki is like super strong. Not so sure I believe him being stronger than Sasuke Kuen, but he's definitely strong if Sasuke Kuen himself was interested in him. I bet he'd be fine helping us get a scroll if I turn the charm on a bit. What charm? Shikamaru gave her girl a confused look. He received a backhand that smacked his face into the dirt in response. Either way, the choice was taken from their hands either way a moment later. Will you shut the hell up? A male voice barked, as a team landed on one of the branches not far away from Daiki. Eno? Shikamaru pulled his head up and glared at her. I'm already low on chakra, what do you expect? I lowered my range down to save chakra. She looked away at the accusatory look, cheeks flushing lightly. Daiki, head back and laughing heartily, froze at the loud shout. Slowly, his head lowered and he stared at the team that disrupted him. It looks like a team from the hidden rain, Shikamaru noted. It was a three-man cell compromised of three older males, late teens to their early twenties by his estimate, two brunettes and one with black hair. The one in the lead, the one that told Daiki to shut up, was unarmed, but the two others at his back, both had odd umbrellas hanging from their backs. Should, should we help him? Choji wondered. They look kind of tough, we should let things play out a bit. Shikamaru shook his head. Ino scoffed. Ever the coward you two. I say we jump them from behind while they're busy with Daiki and Dash. Who the hell do you think you're talking to Rain Scrub? Daiki himself cut her off with a scoff, crossing his muscular arms over his bare chest. Can't you see I'm getting my celebration on? Such arrogance, as expected of a filthy leaf shinobi of the big five. The leader hissed. Even with you being a mere brat and outnumbered three to one, you don't show a lick of fear, pathetic. No caution at all. Typical of a leaf brat that has never had to feel the hardship of we smaller nadash. Dude, shut the hell up. I don't care about your tragic backstory. The rain shinobi was shut up and returned by Daiki scoffing. Go whine somewhere else before I shove my foot up your... How, how dare you speak to me like that? Looking down on we proud and powerful shinobi of the hidden rain village? The leader snarled, his teammates unsheathing their umbrellas and stepping up to his side when he jerked his chin at Daiki. You clearly have no idea to whom you speak. A complete nobody? Daiki snorted. You fool. I am the great Amaya-sama, personal student of Lord Kendachi the right-hand man of the great Hanzo the Salamander himself. The older man roared angrily. Now what do you say to that ha-ha? 
he demanded with a laugh. This guy. Shikamaru's eyes widened at what he heard. He's total bad news. His teammates looked to him in confusion. What do you mean Shikamaru? Ino asked with a frown. Don't you know anything? Shikamaru gaped at her for a second before huffing. Hanzo the Salamander, he took on the three legendary Sanin of our village and beat them, all S rank and way beyond Jonin level strength like Asuma Sensei. His right hand man has to be stupidly strong as well, meaning if this is his personal student, he has to be really strong. His teammates' eyes widened and Choji gasped. Does that mean this guy is like what that Kabuto guy called Daiki? A ringer for his villa dash Choji didn't get to finish, because Daiki barked out a laughter of amusement. Who the hell is Kandachi? Never heard of him before. He dismissed the Rain Shinobi's boasts. Must be a total scrub, especially considering you're still a genin at your age. The now named Amaya trembled with rage. Kill him! He shouted angrily, practically frothing at the mouth in a rage. Feel the might of the Rain Village. Senban shower. Die leaf scum. Senban shower. Amaya's two teammates thrust up and tossed their umbrellas into the air, where they opened up and began to rotate at blinding speeds unleashing twin barges of Senban that blanketed the sky above in multiple thousands of needles. There were so many of them racing through the air down towards Daiki that there was surely no hope he could dodge them. If such a barrage was aimed at Team 10 themselves from such close range, they'd be dead to rights and have no chance of escaping. But Daiki didn't even bother attempting to dodge to Team 10's horror and merely stood there, arms crossed and not moving an inch. All of a sudden though, a black and blue trimmed piece of chest armor appeared on his chest. A weird turtle-headed looking pauldron on his left shoulder. Not a movement made, just all of a sudden it was there. Blink and you'd miss it. And at the same time, a huge shimmering barrier of dark purple spread out around him in a spherical shape. The massive barrage of sunbon impacted against the barrier. A rain of of tick 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 sounds echoing through the forest as they failed to penetrate and fell powerlessly to the ground around Daiki. Or they should have at least. From within the barrier, Daiki held up his hand and each and every single sunbon completely disappeared. And a split moment later, the barrier dissipated from around him. Hmm, 6,537 sunbon, huh? Not bad. A pack of 50 of them costs 2,000 Rio around here. So that's roughly around 260,000 Rio worth of Senban. Daiki for the first time since the confrontation began, uncrossed his arms to bring one hand up to his chin in thought, nodded to himself as he calculated the total worth of the Senban used to attack him. Thanks for the gift lads. Shikamaru gaped. Choji's mouth dropped. Ino practically felt her pupils turn to hearts. That was so cool. She swooned. When did Daiki get so cool on top of being so hot? Amaya screamed. How? Why? The leader of the Rain Ninja team shouted, before clenching his teeth and grinding them audibly. How dare you steal from us? Is it not enough you have ravaged our great country in your selfish wars? Dude, point your fingers somewhere else. I've never even been to Rain. Daiki rolled his eyes. Besides, you're a shinobi? Get over it, you clown. That's the law of the shinobi world. The weak die and the strong thrive. You squealing like a pig just shows your weakness. I am not weak, you damn arrogant scum. Amaya spat. I will beat you down now and show you the difference in our abilities. I shall make you bow and beg for mercy and have you return my subordinate Senban. With a mighty shout, Amaya pushed off, shooting through the air towards Daiki almost fast enough he appeared to blur a bit to the three watching Genin down below. Yet he hit nothing but air. Daiki was there one moment not moving an inch as Amaya closed the distance rapidly. Then, just as the Rain Ninja was about to make contact, Daiki was gone as if he was never there to begin with. A second later, a pair of audible thumps rang out and four pair of eyes whipped around to Amaya's previous position, to find both of his teammates laying face down atop the huge tree branch they were standing on, each with a single sunbon buried in the back of their skulls and Daiki standing between them. Well, I'm a generous guy so I gave two back, but I think I'll keep the rest. Daiki idly commented, before yawning, Um, um I could do with some food right about now. That, holy crap, Kabuto wasn't full of crap. Shikamaru swallowed. Daiki really is as strong as he was saying, I didn't even see him move, not even Chunin move like that. 
Ino shook her head, sobering up from her swooning and frowning at him. Are you saying he's as strong as a jonin? The blonde Yamanaka asked. Definitely. That sheer speed. That barrier he pulled out of nowhere and the way he stole those sunbon somehow. The Nara grimaced and nodded. It was so smooth and he's being so casual about it. He's totally relaxed. He's not even trying at this point. So we should totally avoid Daiki then? Choji asked. Guess so? Ino shrugged. He's a fellow leaf ninja, so he probably won't go too hard on us. Especially with me around. But we should get out of here right now while he's busy. We should stay here, Shikamaru refuted. If he's as strong as I think, he'll catch us if we move now that he's alert. He'll probably move on once he beats this guy. Then we can get out of here. He got two nods from his teammates and they quieted down to watch what was going to happen from this point on. Amaya stared at his dead teammates before spitting. You were fast. I'll give you that. He complimented. Almost serenely, calmly. Just for a second before his lips twisted up into a savage snarl. But don't think for a moment you are powerful just because you managed to slay Tenji and Renji. They are mere trash lapdogs. He roared, hand whipping into his tool pouch and pulling out a scroll. You sure changed your tune quick, Daiki laughed lightly. What happened to you taking back those Senbon for your subordinates? He idly asked, even as he casually picked up the now fallen umbrella Senbon launchers and inspected them idly. Quiet trash, Amaya spat, unrolling the scroll and tossing it into the air. Summoning, great deluge, while in midair, a massive amount of water erupted from it, enough to fill a remarkably large pond. At the same time, Amaya ran through a series of hand seals. Feel the wrath of my most powerful jutsu, he laughed, still doing hand seals. It took him a few seconds to finish with a total of 44, landing on the bird seal, water style, water dragon jutsu, the water up in the air above them, compressed together, forming into a large 30 feet long, 5 feet wide serpentine dragon that tore through the air down towards Daiki. It never even reached Daiki though, as soon as it was within 10 feet of him, the dragon itself broke apart in a shower of rain, no longer held together and formed puddles all around on the grooves of the tree he was standing on. Nom nom nom, thanks for the food, Daiki said, while casually inspecting his fingernails for any dirt. My water dragon, Amaya cried out in shock. You call that a dragon? Daiki stopped inspecting his nails and scoffed, before bringing his hands up and rushing through hand seals so fast Amaya couldn't even keep track finishing on the rat seal in less than a second. But, for sure, he ran through much less of them than Amaya. This is a dragon. Water style. Water dragon jutsu. The puddles left behind by Amaya's dragon surged up into the air at Daiki's command, compressing together, forming into a dragon just the same as Amaya's. Yet somehow, despite having even less water to work with, Daiki's dragon formed into a much, much larger serpentine beast, easily more than twice as long and wide and formed in less than half the time. The huge water dragon roared and scythed through the air towards Amaya, huge jaws snapping open and around the man before he could react. Amaya screamed in pain as the dragon smashed through the branch he was on and dragged him down hundreds of feet to slam him into the ground. It didn't bite through him though despite how easy it would have been and fell apart as soon as it slammed him down into the ground. Ah, ah. Amaya laid there, gasping, writhing in pain. Daiki landed on the ground beside him a minute later, hands casually resting his, his pockets. See, now you have an example to follow and get better. I'm a kind guy like that. The muscular Jenin mused aloud, idly crouching down for a moment and reaching into Amaya's pouch and pulling free an earth scroll. And since I was so kind and let you live after you annoyed me, how about answering a question of mine? F you, Amaya spat. I will tell you nothing. I will kill you and everyone you have ever cared about. Cool story, bro. Daiki shrugged, not making a move as the man feebly rolled onto his side and pushed himself up onto his knees and slowly made hand seals, much slower than the ones he made before. Feel the power granted to me by Lord Kandachi. Amaya roared, glaring up at Daiki, summoning Jutsu. He slammed his hand onto the ground. Daiki casually jumped back as a massive plume of smoke erupted from around them, and Team Ten bore witness to dozens of massive tentacles, each as thick as a person was wide shooting through the air, piercing through the smoke and racing after Daiki. 
Spinning mid-air, Daiki avoided one trying to wrap around his upper torso. At the same time he held a hand out and a single straight sword appeared in his right hand. A fong-like spike on either side of the blade, lightning sparking into existence over the weapon. Daiki swung, cleaving through one of the tentacles and landed, jumped back and avoided another before cutting clean through it. The huge tentacles were down to ten. Then dozens more erupted from the smoke, blowing it away and revealing the beast that was summoned, Amaya laying on all fours atop it. It was a huge, gargantuan seashell, flaring out at the back into an almost tail-like shape with vents along it, and twin shelled horns erupting from the highest point of the shell. Tremble in fear before the mighty Conk King, most powerful of all summons from our almighty Rain Village, second only to the great and powerful Ibus of the Salamander Clan, personal summon of Hanzo-sama himself. Amaya cackled. More and more huge tentacles erupted from the opening in the shell of the huge conch summon. So many they surrounded Daiki like a wall with no openings and converged upon him. For a moment it looked like he was done for. There was no openings for him to escape. Only for the huge tentacles to be rent asunder. The sound of thunder booming through the air. Standing in the middle barely moved was Daiki, but now he held a second sword that was a complete copy of the first. How the hell can that be the most powerful of the summons of rain and at the same time be second? Are you an idiot? Daiki scoffed. Also wrong answer dude. You're really not gonna like how I get my answers now. You've showed your hand now boy. No point bragging now. I see your true strength lies with the blades. But that will do you no good. No physical attack can breach the impenetrable shell of this summon. Amaya ignored him and laughed. Use your Hydro Blaster Jutsu Kong King. Kill him dead. The massive shell summon trembled, pulling back the remains of its tentacles into the crevice opening on the front of it. Before opening wider, an orb of water shimmering into existence at the front of the beast and growing larger and larger until it was nearly half the size of the summon itself. Idiot! Daiki shook his head and gave a hard toss to the hilts of the swords in his hands and letting go. Yet, they did not get sent flying, instead, they began to rotate rapidly midair, generating mass amounts of lightning chakra around them and fed it towards Daiki, while Daiki himself made a single hand seal. I'll just ignore the shell then since you felt the need to tell me its weakness. D. Ayama roared and his summon shook before lurching forward, air emitting in great quantities from the vents on its tail shooting it forward rapidly through the air towards Daiki at the same time the Konk King unleashed its jutsu, firing it off in the form of an absolutely gargantuanly large water pressure cutter. No you. Daiki thrust both hands together and the sounds of the world itself was drowned out by roaring thunder. A massive beam of pure electricity and force erupted outwards and meeting the huge water pressure blast. Despite the size and power of Daiki's jutsu, it was completely dwarfed in scale by the Konk King's own jutsu. Yet, that did not at all stop his own jutsu from piercing right through the much larger jutsu, tearing it apart and shooting right through to slam into and right through the shell of the Konk King and out of the back. A piercing shriek erupted from the huge shelled summon and it trembled in agony. The scent of cooked flesh filling the air as the lightning jutsu cooked it from the inside out. Even its mighty shell could do nothing against a non-physical element that slipped straight through its defenses. It fell silent moments later and went utterly still. No, no, no! Amaya screamed in horror, pushing himself to his feet. How? How? Conk King, how could you loose to this plebeian? Were you weak trash all along? He started stamping his feet. No, you're just an idiot who doesn't know how to use it. You relied on it instead of supporting it like a real summoner. Daiki scoffed, his swords now just idly floating in the air beside him somehow. Now why don't you come down from there? Stop your childish tantrums and stop wasting everyone's time. Everyone. Shikamaru froze. This, I refuse. Amaya screamed, reaching into his pouch on his leg drawing two kunai and launching himself through the air towards Daiki. I will drink from your skull. Making a single hand seal and bringing his kunai to bear, the man blasted forward, moving in a blur so fast now. None of Team Ten even saw him move. No. Daiki's voice echoed simply, thrusting out hand into the air. A loud gag resounded as Amaya suddenly appeared, held helplessly in the air by Daiki's hand around his throat. Even with the Shun Shin you're just far too slow, now you brought this on yourself. The muscular leaf Jenin commented, 
scarlet red eyes beginning to glow ominously as he looked up into Amaya's eyes. A second later, the rain genin began to scream in pain, body thrashing wildly in Daiki's grip, the two kunai slipping from his grasp and falling to the grass. He screamed bloody murder in agonizing pain, eyes rolling up into the back of his head. But it only lasted for a few seconds before Daiki gave a jerk of his wrist and Amaya's neck bent to an odd degree as it snapped. Daiki dropped the corpse to the ground a second later and hummed, Hmm, not a bad haul I guess. He mused aloud. He stepped over the corpse and walked over towards the Conk King, still silent and unmoving. As he approached it, the Conk King's shell opened slowly, trembling mightily and a mere two tentacle appendages slowly rose out of it. It was preparing to fight still. Don't worry, I won't kill you, Daiki assured the summon. The fact you stuck around to fight instead of dismissing yourself after taking that jutsu of mine head on, even though your summoners has died is pretty awesome of you. Though he was clearly not deserving of your loyalty. The tentacles froze at his words. Honestly, I wouldn't have even killed the guy if he just decided to shut up and piss off. Daiki shook his head, coming to a stop a mere five feet from the huge shelled beast. Still, you did help my enemy and I don't usually show mercy. I'll let this go though if you hand over your summoning contract. I already have a summon clan of my own, but I'll find you a much better summoner than that trash. For a moment, the Conk King did nothing, but then slowly pulled its tentacles back inside its shell, only for one to slide back out a moment later, wrapped around a large scroll. It deposited the scroll in front of Daiki. If only that guy was as reasonable as you, he wouldn't have ended up like he did. That's what happens when you wave your tragic backstory around and use it as an excuse to do stupid crap though. Daiki shook his head in clear amusement. You should head back to your home now and recover. I did hit you with one of my strongest attacks after all. The Conk King shook up and down slightly, as if nodding, before erupting into a plume of smoke and disappearing, returning home. As it did, Daiki placed his hand on the huge summoning scroll and it disappeared, before glancing over at the bush Team 10 were hiding beneath. You can come out now, Shikamaru, Choji, Ino. I beat up the scary rain ninja. He called over, laughter dancing in his eyes. Three pair of eyes widened. He knew we were here all along. Shikamaru clicked his tongue. He thought he might have already with that comment about wasting everyone's time, but this just confirmed it. The question though was just how long had had known they were. How troublesome. There really wasn't anything Team 10 could do but obey while well, they could try to flee, but it was blatantly obvious how that would turn out for them. So, they did his bid, standing up from between the bushes and revealing themselves, Ah, hey Daiki. Shikamaru greeted him, hiding a grimace, while his mind raced making and discarding plans by the second. Long time no see. Yeah, yeah, you're looking great. Choji nodded vigorously. You're looking tougher than ever, he praised. Daiki raised an eyebrow at their reactions. Cloud, Chip. He nodded at Shikamaru and Choji in greeting before his eyes moved over to Ino. Five out of ten. He greeted her as well. Shikamaru and Choji took the names on the nose. Ino, however, five out of ten? She sputtered, jade-like teal eyes widening in outrage, her hand coming up to point at him accusatorily. I am at least an eight. Nah, on my personal scale that only attractive girls are on, you only rank a five. Daiki shrugged. So what brings you guys this way? Hoping to ambush someone for one of these? He asked as Ino fumed. Spinning the earth scroll he took from Amaya just a bit go and balancing it on one fingertip. Once again, Shikamaru's eyes widened. That could be a throw away, but... He swallowed. How did you know we already have a heaven scroll? The Nara air asked. Daiki smirked. Figured you'd catch on. He mused. Before pointing to his scarlet red eyes. Simple really. I watched every single team get their scrolls. Wait, scarlet red eyes? Your eyes, they used to be brown. He noted, a dojitsu? Perhaps something like the Byakugan that could see through solid objects and long distances? Something like that. Daiki shrugged, and Shikamaru bit his tongue. Wasn't he supposed to be an orphan? Was he really from some clan in the end? Anyway, three on one, you guys want to try your luck? He spun the scroll atop his finger and invited them to attack. No, no, we're good. Choji quickly waved his hands. We can't, you know, 
steal a scroll from another Kanoha team. That wouldn't be cool. Yeah. Yeah. That wouldn't be cool at all. Shikamaru agreed, praising Choji mentally. Nope. I started with a heaven scroll as well. Daiki shrugged. Though not that I need this at all. I've already long since finished this test. Finished it within 40 minutes. I'm just shooting the breeze out here and seeing if I can find anyone interesting to fight. You, you what? Shikamaru just stared at the muscular boy while his teammates gaped. He'd already passed, and so quickly? Going by that time, he was probably the first to pass at all. Yet he was still out here? Was that even allowed? Well, considering he was here, it must have been. They wouldn't have let him back out otherwise. This was way outside his calculations. And he basically just invited them to attack him a moment ago. He needed to de-escalate. And quick. Well, we wouldn't exactly be a challenge to you. Shikamaru gave a forced laugh. Not with what we just saw you do, you totally destroyed that rain team. And that Amaya guy is the student of some big shot of rain. Second only to their Kage. Not the kind of person we could tango with unlike you. Daiki snorted. That's not as impressive as you think. That guy was trash, as is his sensei. He retorted. Hell, one of their strongest jonin is a traitor from our village called Aoi. Yet, he's barely even qualified to be called a jonin. The only strong guy the Hidden Rain have at all is Hanzo the Salamander. None of the rest are worth talking about. No, no, the fact he considered someone at the level of a jonin, even if barely by his words as trash, was enough for them. They'd get destroyed by a seasoned chunin, never mind a jonin. He sure did know quite a bit about the rain village though. What did he do to that guy Amaya before killing him? Shikamaru wondered briefly. He just looked him in the eye before the guy started screaming. A genjutsu perhaps? But no, Daiki had wanted information and was fine with him not telling, not even fussed in the end. Do those eyes let him read people's minds? Like the Yamanaka clan techniques. Either way, whatever it did wasn't pleasant. He didn't want to end up in that guy's place. He never got the chance to respond. Because, so you don't need it then? Ino perked up and smiled widely at Daiki, hopping over the bushes and stopping in front of him. That's really cool. You're really as strong as Kabuto claimed you were. Stronger even. Maybe even as strong as Sasuke Kuen. What was that idiot blonde doing? Daiki snorted. Almost as strong as Sasuke? Sorry to burst your bubble blondie. But Sasuke isn't even close to as strong as me. He crossed his arms. Ino's mouth dropped open before pulling up into a scowl. But Daiki cut her off before she could reply. There's no boasting about that fact. It's just cold, hard logic and results. I spar with Sasuke all the damn time. Have been doing so for four months now. Twice a week at least. He's not beaten me one sign we graduated. No way. Ino gaped at the boy. Then Sasuke's only the second best genin in the village now? Again, Daiki snorted. Not even close, he laughed. One of the Naidame Hokage students has refused being promoted for decades. He's easily as powerful as a top-tier jonin. He's the second strongest genin in this village behind me. Then third is either Niji Hyuga or Rock Lee. Could go either way. Sasuke is around fifth best, maybe sixth. I give quite good odds on Ten Ten, the teammate of Niji and Lee beating him. S6. Ino staggered back, looking like her entire world had been shattered around her. How annoyingly dramatic and troublesome of her. Females were such a pain. But Daiki revealed something there. A top-tier jonin level combatant and former student of the Naidame Hokage. That guy had to be in his fifties at least, with decades of experience. Yet Daiki so casually claimed he was stronger than him. And just the casual way he said it, no bragging or boasting in it. As if it were just mere fact, told Shikamaru it was the truth. For reference, Naruto is about the seventh strongest genin. Daiki helpfully added. He's not that far off of being as strong as Sasuke now. Seriously? Shikamaru gaped. Really? Choji blinked and asked, surprised as the Nara was. That statement allowed Ino to recover from her shock. Okay, now I know you're talking tall tales. The Yamanaka glared at Daiki. There's no way the dead last is stronger than us, and definitely not nearly as strong as Sasuke. Naruto's always been stronger than you three. Daiki replied with an uncaring shrug. He's just way stronger now. Have you forgotten whose team he's on? He's Sasuke's main sparring partner. They train together every day. An idiot he may be. But unlike you guys, 
He trains himself into the dirt every damn day. But, but, no he doesn't. That idiot always skipped class and never trained. Ino refused to believe Daiki's words. Shikamaru wasn't so sure though. Naruto was an idiot for sure. But there was something about the guy. He skipped because nobody taught him right until Iraka sensei He didn't just run around doing pranks when he wasn't there, you know. Daiki pointed out. He did that a lot, sure. But he was training himself every damn day outside of the academy as well. Hell, the only reason he wasn't a gen in a year and a half ago when he tried to test out the first time is because he failed the clone jutsu, he passed everything else. When he said it like that, it made a lot of sense. The thing about Naruto though, was that, in the academy when it came to sparring 90% of the time he was always paired with Sasuke and got his butt kicked. That was the best they knew of his live combat abilities. And not something really to base his fighting ability on really considering Sasuke was heads and shoulders above everyone in class barring Daiki apparently. Not to mention that one line there. Nobody taught him right until Iraka sensei Shikamaru's suspicions rose. The hate Naruto got around the village was so weird he was an idiot and annoying at times, but nothing that should have deserved hate like that. And the way Daiki said it, it implied sabotage. And Mizuki sensei handled a lot of Naruto's teaching as well. He joined the academy as their teacher only a couple months after Iraka sensei Mizuki sensei who had mysteriously disappeared after graduation. Something was seriously, seriously off here about Naruto. But, nothing he could do about right now, he'd just need to think on it later. I, I don't think I've ever been so insulted, Ino muttered, a haunted look on her face. A mere 5 out of 10 and now even the dead last is apparently way more stronger and useful than me? Am I in a crazy genjutsu? Really? She was still focused on that. No, this is reality, Daiki refuted. And 5 out of 10 is a good thing, you should be proud. It's a score on my personal hot meter. Everyone on it is already beyond the normal, so in reality you're 5 above a standard 10 out of 10. Really? Ino perked up almost instantly, before pumping her fist into the air. Hell yeah! I knew I was a super hottie. Shikamaru rolled his eyes. What an idiot. Wait! The blonde paused. What about Sakura? Three out of ten. Daiki shrugged. And he seriously answered? What was his life, man? What a drag. Ha! Suck it, Sakura. Ino pumped both fists into the air this time, shouting victoriously. So you do think I'm hot then? She grinned at Daiki. And water is wet and the floor is made of floor. He rolled his eyes at her. Yes, you're gorgeous, what about it? Ino was caught entirely flat-footed, cheeks tinting red and the girl utterly avoiding Daiki's gaze. Seriously? That was all it took to shut her up? It was that easy? No, it's probably cause... Daiki's all muscled up and hot to her now. What did she call him, a beefcake? Shikamaru cringed just thinking of that description. Not that he'd ever bother calling a troublesome blonde like Ino gorgeous. Amusing though, first he'd seen her like this. She sure could talk the talk, but when it came to walking the walk, looked like Ino couldn't make the cut. When she said nothing to Daiki's compliment, the boy just shrugged. Well, whatever. He spoke and flicked his finger. The scroll on top of it shooting through the air towards Ino. I think I'll call it quits here. Ino hurriedly caught the scroll and there was a shimmer of wind and leaves around him the muscular genin disappearing from view with what looked like a shunshin. Then Ino gave an eep and jumped, her face turning crimson and steaming with heat. Ino? Choji asked, confused at her reaction and Shikamaru was right there with him. They should be celebrating. They got out of this crazy situation without fighting Daiki and he just gave them the scroll. It was a win-win. A win-win-win really since they didn't need to put in any effort to getting the scroll. He pinched my butt. Shikamaru's eyebrows rose at Ino's muttered response. Oh, so he was a perv then. Okay, whatever. Also, weird, I recovered a ton of chakra when he did it as well. Ino looked up to look Shikamaru in the face. I think he transferred me some chakra when he felt me up. That opened up so many more questions. So Daiki could transfer chakra somehow. On top of that, he either had some crazy hearing and heard them when Ino was saying how low on chakra she was earlier, or he was a sensor that could sense chakra like Ino, or that new Dejitsu of his let him see chakra. That dude was one big question mark now. How annoyingly troublesome. After leaving Team 10 behind, Daiki made a beeline for the tower in the middle of the forest. 
there really wasn't anything left for him here. Anko had already cornered Orochimaru hours ago, and it went exactly as he remembered it for the most part. The only hiccup being, he had mentioned though another stole my gift for himself while trying to save them, quite the interesting one that boy, I'll be keeping an eye on him. Perhaps he'll search me out for power with Sasuke Kuen. It was the exact reason why he hadn't mentioned Orochimaru to the Sandame. Anko would do it for him and the Sanin basically backed him up with his admittance and furthered enforced his loyalty to the village. Now, he not only had proof of being willing to give his life for the village to protect it from a bijou plot, but also would have it on the record he faced off against one of the three legendary Sanin to protect his comrades. Basically, it was good PR and all that. Especially since Orochimaru full-on praised his jutsu to Anko, who would report it as well. Unlike the situation with Isabu that the Sandame seemed to be keeping under wraps, this would be one that probably spread thanks to all the people that saw the jutsu and would enhance his reputation with everyone else. Really, his genius just could not be underestimated. No, genius wasn't enough to describe his plan here. He was more like a super elite genius. Aizen should take notes from him. You really do love to toot your own horn, don't you? You realize it was a pretty basic plan, right? Isabu deadpanned. Also, why did you lie to that shinobi from Rain? I know you know whom his sensei is. I was just messing with him? Daiki ignored the slander against his clear genius and shrugged as he hopped through the trees. Also, I wanted to put him down a bit. He was arrogant as all hell. Of course he remembered who his sensei was, especially when he saw the Kank King summon. Naruto and Jiraiya fought it during the time skip alongside the sensei of that Amaya guy who apparently abandoned Rain once pain or rather Nagato killed Hanzo and took over. A bit hypocritical of you, considering how arrogant you are. Isabu snorted. I mean, at least I'm a lovable, arrogant douchebag. Daiki replied, unlike Amaya, the way he talked, you'd think he was a young master from some Chinese cultivation series. He was half expecting the guy to talk about giving him a green hat or something. It was seriously cringe to see that kind of thing play out in front of him. So he had some fun tearing him down. Lovable? I have a feeling you live in your own little world sometimes. He could practically see Isabu rolling his eyes. I do. Unfortunately, I have to share it with everyone else. Daiki retorted. Isabu sighed. Daiki grinned. Well, either way, it was lucky I came across Amaya, I'll admit that much. He admitted. For one thing, through tearing apart his mind, he learned how to train a few water jutsu he hadn't known before, and one specifically only promising rain ninja learned apparently. The water style, black rain jutsu. It was a black type elemental technique like the black lightning of Kumo. Black style elemental jutsu were much stronger than average. The jutsu itself created a rain cloud that let loose a downpour of black rain, the size and range of it could be very massive in size depending on how much chakra was put into it and on top of that, the black rain even had properties of oil and could be set alight with a fire jutsu. With it, Daiki was sure that he could maybe use it to reverse engineer the process behind turning other elemental jutsu into black versions. And on top of that, he even got some information on Aoi Rokusho, who had stolen the Naidame's legendary Raijin no Ken, the Thunder God Blade. He'd love to get his hands on that and use it to possible augment his Kiba blades, or maybe even turn it into a third Kiba blade. Three was the best number. Have you changed your name to Zoro without me knowing? Somehow? Isabu asked in amusement. Though I do agree, three is the best. Daiki Roronoa Yurii. Hmm, that didn't sound too bad, actually. No. Isabu shut him down instantly. Fair enough, his name was already badass enough already. Though you're not far off, Daiki admitted. The Kiba blades are amazing already. But there's a limit to the force they have when I control them. I'm thinking I'll manifest your tails and wield the blades with them. So making a third version would be a good idea. Plus, also, it would leave his hands open for Jutsu. Good luck with that, those blades were created in Yuzu no Kuni to my knowledge, they are, to my knowledge, chakra blades like the ones you gained from the village of artisans, but of much greater power and quality yet at the same time filled with seals, Uzumaki seals. Isabu informed. Daiki grimaced. That would indeed be a problem. As good as he was with seals now, he still didn't come close to the Uzumaki. On top of that, he'd thoroughly inspected the blades and found no trace of seals on them, which meant they were on the inside of the blade. Almost impossible for most to get a look at without taking them apart. 
Thankfully, he had a bit of silver lining there, with the Shinkigen he could peer inside them. Now he just needed to reach the level of someone who could enslave the Death God through a mask. Easy. Not. It will take time, but I'm sure you can do it. You have quite the talent for the sealing arts that I admit. Isabu reassured him. Beyond that, who do you plan to make the summoner of the Conk King? Daiki smiled as he replied. I'm not sure, he admitted aloud. The Conk King wasn't like the newbie summon clans he made from the beasts in this forest. It was an actual powerful summon beast well beyond them. He already knew its weakness, which was why he won so easily. But originally, in the other timeline, it would cause trouble for not only Naruto, but Jiraiya as well and almost kill Jiraiya thanks to its powerful Jinjutsu Mist. Not unlike Isabu's own. On top of that, it had those tentacles that normal kanai and weapons would have real trouble cutting through. He only had it so easy thanks to the Kiba Blades. And then there was that huge water cannon jutsu it fired off against him. That was a powerful jutsu for sure. And even with its awkward shape and huge size, the Conk King was surprisingly fast and able. And that wasn't even getting into how durable its shell was. It was scalable to a mountain itself, he was sure. It had taken Naruto using a big ball Rasengan almost as large as he was tall and wider than he was to defeat it while it was pinned by Jiraiya. A technique that, at not even a fifth of that size when used against Itachi's doppelganger, had created a crater hundreds of feet in diameter. And even then he was sure it only worked because the Rasengan itself not only ground into a target, but exploded into a massive shockwave after that fact when fired off fully. If it wasn't an attack that could pass through its shell and hit it right within, there was few attacks that came to mind that could bring it down. All in all, the Conk King was a beastly summon boss, possibly right up there with Shiromori, and most likely had a clan alongside it. One thing Amaya wasn't wrong in, was his confidence in the Conk King, that Daiki would admit. He arrived at the tower not long later, 20 minutes or so, pausing in front of it before entering and peering inside. There was a variety of leaf chunin present within the building, and he could see Anko as well, at the top of the tower, resting in a back room, laying along a couch. On top of that, in the middle floor, within a large mess hall, he noted there were two teams of Genin present. It was Gara and his siblings, and Team 8 comprising of Hinata, Kiba, and Shino. So those two were the only other teams that made it so far, huh? Well, there's still four days. Daiki mused, making his way inside, not bothering with the entrance room and just jumping straight up onto the pathways above leading into the middle flooring. The middle floor from what he could see didn't just have the mess hall, but a bunch of dorm-like rooms with three single beds in them. I guess I'll go pick out a room, he mused. There seemed to be some kind of chunin behind a desk at the area where the rooms were, so he headed there first, that guy probably handled the room keys. He'd head to the mess hall first, mostly to see Hinata and maybe have a Luxi at Gara. His eyes flickered up, peering through the ceiling up into the top floor, where he saw someone rushing out of the control room towards Anko. He'd most likely be getting company soon. So that was what he did. He headed over to the Chunin at the dorm rooms, acquired a key from the man while he was gaping at the fact he was a single genin allowed to compete and that he had completed the exam already. Then he headed into his room and closed the door beside him. Right, first things first. Daiki hummed, sitting on the bed. He brought his hands together in a cross seal, a shadow clone popping into existence beside the bed. You know what to do, he told his identical copy. Back to the grind, his clone grinned. Suinpa, he said simply, and in a flash of black and green, disappeared, heading to Isabu's dimension. He'd created that clone with half the total amount of chakra he had, who would then use the jutsu against himself to create a mass amount of clones, who would then all work on his newest jutsu, since they were water affinity and would be quicker to learn over Yagura's wind jutsu. He definitely wasn't going to let his grind fall to the wayside just because he was stuck here for four days. Right. Now let's get a good look at my stats. Daiki grinned and clapped his hands. He was eager to see just how much his chakra capacity had grown due to the new seal on his neck. Status. He thought. Name. Daiki Yuriai, age, 13, chakra capacity, 81, 300 slash 162, 600 low tier kage, strength, 172 slash, endurance, 246 slash, durability, 
172 slash agility 172 slash taijutsu 203 out of 500 ninjutsu 262 slash 500 jinjutsu 45 slash 500 bukijutsu 116 to 500 chakra control 225 slash 500 chakra affinities lightning advanced roar with the power of thunder water advanced the sea parts before you fuinjutsu advanced the breath hitches daiki's eyes flew wide open at what he saw 162,600 and low tier kage holy sage he breached into the kage realm in chakra yes he pumped his fist into the air hopping off the bed sure it may have only been low tier as far as kage went but that didn't matter that was the freaking kage tier hmm really that's all it takes to reach kage status i can only half submerge my body in here isabu uttered surprised how sad daiki froze you picking a fight buddy no just a factual statement i don't bully the weak isabu fired back Daiki would have loved to give him a zinger of a burning comeback and totally destroy the bijou's self-esteem. But, luckily for the big giant turtle, there was a knock at his door that saved him from such a fate. You keep telling yourself that, Daiki. It's as true as the sky being purple. But whatever helps you sleep at night. Isabu snorted. Daiki vowed revenge. But not now, he already knew who was at his door. He made his way over and pulled it open, and surprise, surprise, a familiar attractive and voluptuous purple-haired hottie dressed in a short tiny orange skirt, long open tan trench coat and skimpy mesh armor that showed off her feminine figure deliciously was standing on the other side of the doorway. Daiki leaned against the door frame and gave her a smoldering stare and ever so debonair smile. Sup good looking, he greeted her. Anko didn't even twitch. We need to talk, brat. Daiki was already well aware of why Anko came searching him out for a little talk. That didn't mean he couldn't be a little jerk about it for a laugh, though. Talking is pretty low on the list of what I want to get up to with you. He grinned at the purple-haired woman. Anko rolled her eyes and bodily pushed past him into the room. Daiki shrugged, pushing off the door frame and closing the door behind him. She looked around the room almost suspiciously, as if searching for something out of place. Daiki had to resist the urge to snort. What? Did she think he had her old teacher stuffed beneath one of the beds or in one of the tiny closets? Maybe Orochimaru was in the bathroom soaping up and having a rub-a-dub-dub -dub in the tub with a nice warm and relaxing bubble bath? So, you wanted to talk? Daiki prompted, crossing his arms. Or we could skip it and get right to the spicy part. I'm good with that. Hilarious. Anko scoffed and turned back around to look at him. You should be dead. She dropped on him, right to the point and ever so bluntly. Pretty sure I shouldn't be. He shrugged back. There was no need to be so dramatic about it. While it was true the curse seal had a massive fatality rate, with only a 10% survival chance that didn't just come down to the body. A lot of it came down to willpower and toughing out the pain of the seal itself like Sasuke did. The guy went through a bunch of hallucinations and crap in the original timeline and was probably going through them right this very moment actually. It was excruciatingly painful for sure, Daiki could attest to that, but not exactly something Daiki would roll over, give up and die from. That was quitter talk. A complete antithesis to the mentality needed for throwing oneself into the great grind. Pain was just weakness leaving the body. Stop being contrary brat. Anko rolled her eyes. I know you have the curse seal. My old teacher was happy to brag about it. That Uchiha kid is probably writhing in agony right about now and a step from croaking. But what I don't understand is why you're not. It's mighty suspicious. He could see where she was coming from, after all, him gaining the curse seal, yet not going through the same agonizing hours on end of hanging to life by a thread, fighting and clawing tooth and nail mentally for survival, would imply that he was given something different, or maybe even had it all along and Orochimaru bringing it up was all just a ruse to allow him to use it freely. Too bad for her, he was above little things like that. Orochimaru did give me his little hickey seal. Daiki shrugged, coming right out with it. It's just too bad for him, he's a complete hack with seals and I'm utterly immune to his little body jacking stunt. Tough talk for an itty bitty genin. Anko raised an eyebrow at him, but he noticed she stilled a bit at the mention of the body jacking. 
You have to admit though kid, you're suspicious as hell right now. You finished the exam with a clone of all things, while your real self was still out in the forest. And not long later, less than half an hour even by our estimates, you faced off against Orochimaru. What's your point? Daiki crossed his arms. In case you haven't realized yet, I literally put my life on the line and fought one of the three legendary Sanin to protect my comrades. You see that big black tornado? All me. I took his little seal, amped myself with it and blew him the F away. And if it was just that, it would have been fine except for that one little bit at the end. Anko narrowed her eyes at him. It's the fact you're completely fine right now when anyone else recorded that has been given the curse seal, writhed in agony for at least 10 hours, few ever have survived it. He wondered idly how she would react to the fact that Orochimaru actually had bases full of kidnapped people that had survived it, and had literal hundreds of people that could access the curse seal level too. Have you taken into account the fact I'm not a little biatch like everyone else? Daiki retorted, raising an eyebrow challengingly at her. Maybe everyone else was just too mentally weak to control it like me. One of the woman's hands curled into a fist so tight he heard her knuckles pop. You've got too big of a mouth on you, kid? She growled. Good shinobi and kunoichi alike from this village have died in agony from that seal. I barely survived a weaker version of it myself and it's been a curse to me for a decade. That doesn't change my point, sucks for them and you I guess and I sympathize. But when it comes to me, you're not dealing with the average ninja warrior anymore. Daiki retorted. I told you already, he's a complete hack when it comes to seals and I'm completely immune to the real purpose of the curse seal. And am I supposed to just take your word for it? Anko bared her teeth. You've done a whole lot of boasting, but like it or not, my teacher is one of the greatest geniuses to ever come from this village. An S-class legend that only the Hokage could defeat in a fight now. And you, some random genin, if a talented one, claim you're completely immune to the curse seal that has felled even experienced and powerful jonin? Where's the proof? You know, I get this is kind of an important topic for you and has been like a curse for you, no pun intended, but you're not as hot when you're this pushy. Daiki rolled his eyes. You've already told the old man about this, right? What did he say? He changed the subject lightly. Nothing, he was tight-lipped and told me not to worry about it. Just got this thoughtful look on his face. Said something about, is that how it is and dismissed me? Anko replied eyes narrowing even thinner at the mention of the Hokage. Told me to speak with you about it, said I'd get my answers. Hmm. Did that mean that old man third had caught on to exactly how he was able to make the curse seal his own? Thanks to Isabu? It's really not that big of a logic jump if one understands your status as a Jinchuriki, Isabu chimed in. In fact, I do believe in the other timeline this Orochimaru fellow used that Yukamara boy whose chakra could suppress mine in the hopes of making him my Jinchuriki and then taking over his body with me unable to do anything due to being suppressed. Uh, that made sense. He'd always wondered what Orochimaru's whole deal was during that point, and why he bothered with it. But then, one of his biggest problems later revealed was having too weak of a body to use Senjutsu. As a perfect Jinchuriki, that would more or less be a non-issue for him. Still, he had to wonder where that Yukimaru kid came from and how his chakra had an effect on Isabu. He's the son of Yagura, it is a mutation derived from being exposed to my own chakra upon being conceived, Isabu explained. Odd though, the Yukimaru of your memories was clearly a teenager of around your current age. The one I know of should barely be over his toddler years right now. That was indeed weird. And it explained a lot actually. Neat. Well, not that it mattered anymore, since he was Isabu's Jinchuriki now and he didn't plan on ever stopping being so. He was the great Lord Sanbai Jinchurik-sama. Anyway... It seemed that the Sandame was leaving the big reveal up to him here. He could tell Anko about his status as a Jinchuriki and reveal how he bodied the curse seal and made it his own and put an end to this nonsense here and now. It would be a slight problem of someone else knowing of his status as a Jinchuriki, but then Anko wasn't exactly the type to give that information out freely, and would even most likely take it to her grave even under torture. And no doubt the old man had at least told his advisors, since he trusted them. And those two old clowns probably told Danzo. Annoying, and they'd have their eyes on him, but easy to deal with, and he already planned on dealing with Danzo at some point. It's pretty simple honestly, no real big grand mystery behind it. Daiki decided to just bite the bullet and shrugged. I'm a Jinchuriki, those curse seals all have a shard of your teacher's soul in them so he can control the people with them and eventually take over their bodies if he wants, and as long as one of them remains, he can't actually die. 
When he put his hickey seal on me, my bijou destroyed the part of Orochimaru in it and made it pretty much benign, as in, I can use the benefits of the seal without any of the drawbacks. Silence. Anko's eyes slowly widened at his words. His, his soul. Anko's mouth floundered a bit and her expression screwed up in disgust. You mean I have a piece of Orochimaru inside me right now? Huh, she focused more on that than the Jinchuriki thing. Yup, lucky bastard, Daiki nodded and gave a huff. Basically, the way the seal works is it naturally draws in something called nature energy. The shard of Orochimaru would then convert that energy into nature chakra and something called Senjutsu and pass it through into you, giving you a boost in a power, but at the same time, encroaching your own chakra and making the user feel dependent on him, so he can eventually basically take over other people's bodies. Anko sat that fine booty of hers down on one of the three beds within the room. The one he'd chosen to sleep in tonight at that. Senjutsu? That's crazy high-tier stuff. Only Lord Jiraiya is said to be able to use it. Not even the Hokage can. She placed her hands on her knees and hunched over in thought. It was a very unladylike seating position and if he was in front of her, he could see up her skirt for sure. So he did just that, stepping over to stand in front of her, just for a peek. Huh, a purple lingerie. Nice. But wait, how do you know all this? She looked up, then realized where he was looking and gave him a dry look. Daiki shrugged unrepentantly, meeting her eyes. His memories? Daiki shrugged, pulling on his cover story for some of his knowledge. I didn't get much of them left behind by the soul fragment when it was destroyed, but I did basically get a front row seat to how he made the seal and know why it's such a pain in the giant to do anything about. It was honestly more like the surface thoughts of a shadow clone that I picked up, mind you. Anko's eyes widened at his words. You know how it's made? She jumped to her feet and grabbed him by the shoulders. Does that mean you can remove it? Daiki smirked. I can do one better. He grasped her hands and pulled them off. I can't remove it. That's actually impossible without killing you. But I know how to make it better, safe to use and more. He touched his hand to his chest plate and sealed it away, leaving him bare-chested in front of the voluptuous purple-haired special Jonin. That's one fly storage seal. She shook her head, not even reacting to the half-nudity. If you know how it was made and can make it even better and safe, why can't you remove it? She pressed. Ha, uh, she seemed more interested in getting it removed than a safe power boost. He was actually a bit impressed at her not even blinking at the offer of a free power up. The seal is connected to your chakra network itself, originally more like a parasite than anything else and ripping it away would destroy parts of your coils and kill you. He responded bluntly. Granted it was Isabu that had deduced that part. Like it or not, it's a part of you, but I've got the ability to turn it from a parasite into more of a symbiotic existence, better even since it would be more like a natural part of your body and not in any way a living creature. Damn it! Anko grimaced. Something akin almost to despair flashing in her eyes for just a moment before she grit her teeth. Fine. All right. Can you do it for me then? And why did you take your top off, kid? Daiki rolled his eyes. To show you how I've changed up my seal, he turned around and showed his back to her, angling his head to the side to bare his neck to give her a better look. Have a look. I modified my own already. This isn't the curse seal of heaven anymore. It's my heavenly star seal. To punctuate his words, he drew on the seal itself and felt as the tattoo-like markings spread out over his body and strength suffused his body. A light touch pressed against his shoulder and he felt Anko's finger trace the seal. It looks completely different. She noted. And you can do this for me? She asked again. Daiki grimaced himself this time, releasing the seal and allowing the marks and powers to fade away. He turned around and looked the woman in the eye. Yes and no, he answered. The big problem is, you don't exactly have a bijou living inside you to kill off the Orochimaru soul shard like I do. I'd have to project myself into your seal, find it, then kill it while it's already formed before I can do that. Anko's face fell. So it's impossible then. She sighed, slumping in defeat and planking that fine badonkadonk of hers back on the bed. It was kind of odd having such a spunky confident woman sitting in front of him with such a sad defeated look on her face. I didn't say that. So turn that frown upside down, hot stuff. Daiki put out. Like you said, I don't exactly have a bijou inside my head kid like you. No idea how you hid that by the way. Anko shrugged. So how would you do it then? Projecting my consciousness into the seal itself isn't impossible. It's based on a seal for sealing a bijou and making a jinchuriki at the base. If a crappy one, 
Daiki replied, grinning at her. All I'd need to do is get in there, kill the shard of your old teacher and presto you're good to go. Somehow I'm betting the way you said that is way simpler than it actually is. Anko pointed out dryly, though her eyes lit up at his words a bit. Right on the money, Daiki nodded. It sounds simple when I say it like that, but I'll still need to go in there and kill what amounts to Orochimaru. Sure, he'll have way less chakra to use than the real one, but this is still Orochimaru we're talking about here, and not just a shard that hadn't finished forming that got crushed the second it appeared in my body. Anko snorted. Yeah, if killing him was that simple, he wouldn't he alive and kicking right now. I can do it, I just need time. And it would help to know how he fights as well. Daiki shrugged. Besides, I'll vent a little jealousy out on him for getting inside you before me. He winked at her. And there may be a little side benefit to things as well. After all, he was sure he could still draw on Isabu's power even with his consciousness in there. And he'd have his own seal too. And when he killed it, he could snap up the chakra of it and add it to his own for a decent boost in chakra capacity just like the one Isabu crushed out of existence. Beyond that, Anko was a prodigy student of Orochimaru's back in the day as a teen. She was held back by the seal itself to his knowledge. Removing that hamstring and actively making it better for her may make it so she could catch up to the likes of Kakashi and Gai, more or less becoming an S-class Kunoichi, possibly. And another strong and useful ally against the Akatsuki. Are you sure you ain't some kid of Lord Jiraiya? You're one horny little pervert? Anko barked out a laugh in pure amusement, the mood lightening almost immediately. Can't say I don't like the confidence in you though. Jiraiya wishes he had a kid as awesome as me. Daiki snorted. Also, I'm a teenager, and you're literally as hot as hot can be and wearing practically nothing. You make it hard to think straight. He admitted truthfully. Seriously. He had an unbelievably hard time keeping his eyes off those D's of hers. Case in point his eyes drifted to the large bodacious melons stretching out her mesh shirt underneath the trench coat she was wearing. Anko followed his gaze and smirked, crossing her arms under her melons and making them swell up even larger into a mountainous cleavage. Like my D's do ya? She teased. Damn straight. Daiki nodded. Fair enough then. Anko snorted and then stood up before boldly reaching forward with one hand and feeling his member. She opened her mouth to say something before pausing and her eyes widened. Damn kid, you're packing quite the weapon down here. There's a reason I call it Manda 2.0. Daiki smirked at her, baring his teeth. She erupted in a hail of hilarity. Oh hell, that old snake would rage so hard if he heard you say that. Good on you? Anko praised, and grasping his half-hard member through his pants stroking it with her palm. I'll be real here, kid. If you manage what you said, I'm fine with letting you have your fun with me and riding me like a pony. His member throbbed at the mental image and a grin appeared on her face. Seems you like the sound of that, huh? Anko teased and licked her lips at him. And before his eyes, her tongue stretched out to below her chin and she wiggled it at him before pulling it back between her plump lips. Damn tease. That'll have to wait until later, kid. Anko told him walking past him and trailing a single finger over his bare shoulders as she did. I'll look you up during the month leading up to the final round of the exams and show you what I can of my old sensei's fighting style and jutsu. Daiki gave her a deadpan look. And what am I supposed to do with this? He pointed at his massive blue balls. That is not my problem right now, she shrugged. You can always go find Kurinai. Not that she comes close to how hot I am, but she's an easy lay as you know and she might tide you by until you get your hands on this prize. She looked over her shoulder at him as she reached the door, and then gave her cheeks a little spank over her skirt, letting him know exactly what the prize she was talking about was, and then she opened the door and left the room behind, leaving Daiki standing there with massive blue balls and nobody to use it on. Maybe he could see about clubbing some seals with it, see if that euphemism actually held up. Why did you make it out as if you wouldn't be capable of defeating the shard of Orochimaru right now? Isabu struck up conversation as he worked and toiled away. And by that, he meant he sat absolutely still while a clone of his took a needle filled with sealing ink and his own blood. An hour had passed now since Anko left him with the most raging of all raging erections horny for a piece of pie, and until he could calm himself down and shake off the blue balls that would no doubt come, he figured he'd get something productive done and dusted with. 
As such, he was finally getting around to enhancing the Dimension Force Seal. And by that, he meant adding the Barrier Seal, the Chakra Absorption Seal, and the Chakra Filter Seal to the final product. You clearly wanted to bed the woman very much, the Shard of Orochimaru will be nowhere near his full strength, not with the pitiful amount of Chakra it will have available to it, less even than the amount you had when we first met, the three-tailed Bijou continued. He would be trapped in there, nowhere to run and force to face you with full access to my power, formidable the man may be, but there's only so much one can do with so little chakra. Daiki forced himself not to grimace at the thought. For sure, he could have done it. He could have killed that shard, taken its chakra for another boost in his capacity, fixed Anko's seal and railing her silly right here and right now. As much as he wanted to do that though, he wanted to focus on the bigger picture. That could come later, after he'd learned all he could of Orochimaru's jutsu and fighting style from Anko herself, she was bound to know a bunch of jutsu of his, like that hidden shadow snake hand's jutsu. He'd always wondered before if that required a summoning contract with the snakes to use, and if so, he might be able to apply the usage of it to make jutsu with the chameleons kind of like Jiraiya's toad jutsu. Ah, how obvious, I should have realized. Isabu paused at Daiki's thoughts. The only thing that comes before rutting like a lust-filled wild beast with you is your beloved grind and gaining even more power. Don't knock it till you try it. Daiki replied with a mental shrug. I don't need to. I can share your senses such as touch whenever I please due to there being no barriers between us. It is a pleasant feeling I suppose, but I do not harbor the attraction you do to human females, Isabu retorted. Nor do I have a fascination with large bouncing mammaries or perky round giants. Sucks to suck, Daiki snorted. Say that when you can boast having even a fiftieth of the chakra I do. Isabu shot back. F you. Daiki mentally gave him the finger. Sorry. I'm not a slovenly human woman. Are those stolen eyes of yours going bad already? Isabu retorted. And from there they devolved into some squabbling and ribbing of each other while his shadow cloned pierced his hands with a needle over and over. Despite what he claimed to his inner turtle power buddy, Serpent King Manda 2.0 Sage Mode, thought otherwise. And by that, Daiki meant that his raging member took absolutely ages to calm down. He wasn't anywhere near Snow Country and nor did he have a summoning contract for them, so it just wasn't possible to club some seals either. So he just had to tough it out and deal with the blue balls. Bickering with Isabu helped keep his mind off of it at least. Even if he still had to walk a little bit gingerly, when it should be Anko walking bow-legged in his place. But, such was life. The things I do for the grind. Daiki shook his head, idly examining his newly enhanced hand seals. He held one hand up and focused his chakra and thought into it and watched as a small spherical barrier shimmered into existence around his hand. He could make it way, way bigger, the size and sturdiness of it dependent on the amount of chakra he put into it, but he was just testing it out for now. With his other hand, he held out one finger, lightning sparking into existence and buzzing loudly around it and he gave a single finger thrust. A loud tick noise echoed throughout the room, and his fingers was rebuffed. Not bad. Daiki whistled, he could pierce through solid rock with a lightning-enhanced finger thrust nowadays. A far cry from in the beginning when he could barely crinkle a leaf. And that was with a pitifully small amount of chakra. At full capacity, this barrier seal of his could probably block a rank jutsu and not fall. He withdrew his chakra from the seal and watched the shield flickered and disappear, before reaching up and stretching his arms over his shoulders. Guess I'll go take a look around here now, he mused. There really wasn't much for him to do right now. The only thing he had to do was physical training, but he could do that later, and his clones were already working on the jutsu that had been ever so generously donated to him in the forest. Daiki left his room for the next few days, locking the door behind him and went a little donner through the tower. A single glance with his eyes told him where the most interesting people to look up were, and by that he meant the mess hall. Well, Anko was at the top of the tower talking to some very interesting people and a cripple. He wasn't expecting Danzo to be there, but he wasn't important at all, not right now anyway. They're probably watching me right now. Daiki mused. There were cameras spread about all over the building, even one in his bedroom. It was a simple matter to notice them with his eyes, even hidden within the wall as they were. He'd already covered the lens. 
If it was just normal day, he wouldn't mind, in fact, he would have timed it just right for when a time only Anko was watching and then gave her a good show. But he was waiting on a delivery right now. Two actually. And he didn't know when his summons would pop up with them. So, they didn't get to spy on him like every other Genin competitor in this tower. When he arrived in the mess hall, Daiki was quick to notice the occupants. As he confirmed more than an hour ago, Team 8 were present, as were Gara and his siblings. Odd that they were still hanging around in here, but then, there really wasn't much to do in the tower. I totally should have stayed it out in the forest. Daiki groaned inwardly. He should have stuck around and kept an eye on Sakura to see how she did against the team from sound. Maybe tease her a bit more about her butt. It was so funny when she tried to take a swing at him and moved in practically slow motion to his eyes. The way he left her in a tizzy brought a smirk to his face. He shook his head putting that out of mind. It wasn't possible now after all. Who should I sit with, I wonder? He mused. There were three options. Hinata and her team near the front tables, Kankuro and Tamari in the absolute middle, as if they ruled the territory or Gara lounging at the very bottom corner out of sight keeping to himself. Hinata or Tamari. A tough choice, Hinata was hot, but she was into Naruto so no progress could be made there. Tamari was a hot older girl, but she was also here to destroy his village and kill everyone, and had a bit of a cruel condescending streak for Kanoha Nin currently. It would usually just come down to those two choices. But Gara, it could be fun to mess with him. Decisions, decisions. Daiki smirked, casually making his way to the front of the room where a long selection of food was prepared and waiting to be picked from. All eyes of the occupants of the mess hall want to him as he casually made his way over to the selection of food. Hmm, not bad a selection either Daiki noted. Yoink, yoink, yoink. He grabbed up some chicken, some egg, some fish and paused at the end where he found a selection of meat ranging from pork to lamb. Oh ho, doner kebab. Yoinkity yoinky yoink. He'd gained quite the taste for it after he fused with his alternate self. Doner kebab had been his absolutely favorite food. Now I just need to find somewhere that does some nice chili sauce one of these days. He mused to himself, with a massive platter of meat to fill his belly and fuel his gains later. Daiki turned around and eyed the occupants again, idly glancing them over. Tempting, oh so tempting to go poke fun at Gara, it really honestly was. But sadly, it was probably best that he did not do that. Things were going to be a big pain in the giant as was soon days. Bullying Gara would definitely throw a few things off course. If at all possible, he'd like to keep Gara's path alone the same into the finals. There was no telling where he'd play into things if, say, Daiki was the one to fight him and beat him during the preliminaries. He'd have enough to deal with considering he wanted Old Man Third to survive and Orochimaru seemingly was thinking sending Kimimaro after his head. And Gara would definitely not be in the finals if Daiki went and had some fun poking at him and giving him the good ol' run around. The redhead would no doubt snap, try to murder him, and then Daiki would be forced to put the boot to his sand-covered head. Best to play it safe then. He mused and began making his way over to where teammate was situated. He could at least pass some time flirting with Hinata. As he made his way over, he passed by the two older San siblings and met Tamari's eyes. He winked at her. Her eyebrows rose, but she smiled back at him. What's with Kanoha? It's full of total hotties. He read her surface thoughts. Eh, sup? Daiki greeted Hinata and her team a second later sliding into the seat beside the Hyuga girl and putting his tray of food down. Hope you don't mind company. Hello, Daiki Kuen. Hinata gave him a warm smile in return. Feel free, dude, Kiba snorted. Good timing anyway. I've been wanting to ask you some things, he said, while the bug using Shino Abure merely gave a slight incline of his head in a nod as greeting. Daiki gave the Abure a nod back before turning his attention to Kiba, and that would be he asked the canine shinobi, absently reaching down and grabbing up a big honking piece of chicken and taking a big bite out of it. For one, the hell happened to you? Kiba raised an eyebrow and leaned forward to look him in the eyes. It's only been, what, six or so months since we all graduated, and since then you've gone on to become some super ninja, apparently, at least according to this Kabuto dude we talked. Special permission from the Hokage to do this exam solo, and you even have freaking Sasuke looking for info on you, hell. 
Hinata was even telling us we needed to avoid you in the exam if we didn't want taken out straight away. Nothing much. I just trained hard. Ate my veggies and drank plenty of juice. Daiki shrugged, then looked to Hinata and grinned at her. You wanted to avoid me, huh? I'm hurt. His grin transitioned into a pout. Hinata's warm smile stretched to Tad and she rose a hand to cover her mouth politely. Era, did you want to find me in the forest? She asked in return and Daiki froze and then blinked, taken aback. If I knew you missed me so much, I would have waited for you. Her hand moved around to cup her pale cheek daintily. What just happened? Did she just flirt back with him? And with the way he'd offhandedly mentioned to try on her blonde crush? A glance at her teammates told him they were just as surprised as he. Kiba was gaping at her wide-eyed and Shino's eyebrows had risen up above his sunglasses rising into his hairline. For a moment, Daiki just stared at the Huga heiress, completely taken aback by her confident, rather bold reply. And that era era, it took his mighty strong willpower to stop himself from shivering. Ten out of ten, that was perfect. His stunned reaction to her reply was very obvious, and Hinata's smile grew a tiny bit wider. You totally should have. He forced his shock down and grinned at the older girl. There was a point there where I had to sit still for a good few hours. Looking at you would have made it much more bearable. Her cheeks tinted red, but before she could reply, her teammate jumped in. Sitting around for a few hours out there? Guess we're so good even a hotshot ringer like you're getting called would have trouble keeping up. Kiba grinned at him. We finished in just four hours, second team overall and even broke a few records. The feral dog using Shinobi boasted proudly. I finished in less than 45 minutes and was the first to finish the exam actually. If you're going by the Suna team over there beating you for placements, then you guys are third actually. Daiki burst his bubble and smirked at him, idly picking up and chomping down on a piece of kebab meat. I just didn't feel like waiting around, so went to play some more in the forest and have some fun. What? Kiba blinked, the proud grin on his face disappearing and he stared at Daiki blankly. No way! He shot to his feet and slammed his hands on the table. His loud eruption drew three sets of eyes. Two male and one belonging to a pretty sandy blonde. No, he is not lying. Shino commented looking at Daiki in the eye through his sunglasses. Why? Because only a fool would lie about a thing so easy to confirm when any exam proctor could tell us. What he said. Daiki's smirk grew to taunting proportions. Kiba clicked his tongue. Well, whatever we still beat Sasuke and Naruto at least. He sat back down. Arms crossed. Guess that ringer crap has some merit to it then, eh? Maybe, or maybe I'm just that good. Daiki shrugged. Don't put too much stock into the ringer thing. Most ringers aren't absolute badasses like me. But like Sasuke, hell, give it a year or so and Hinata could be one as well. You think so? Hinata hummed. I know so. He turned his ever so lovable smirk on her. Ah, uh, thank you. She looked away, thanking him softly. But even then she couldn't hide how pleased her voice sounded. Eh, more confident and taking his advice or not, she still wasn't quite used to the honest praise yet. All right the heck is going on between you two? Kiba questioned, looking between the pair of them weirdly. Hinata's been acting weird lately, totally different, and you're totally flirting with her bro. Hinata turned back around to reply, but Daiki beat her to it. Nothing much, just been helping her train and change some things to get what she wants. He shrugged. Kiba's eyebrows rose, so you're the reason for the new look and how fast she's been improving? He asked, leaning back in surprise. Something like that, Daiki shrugged again. I just gave her some home truths. Ain't that right good looking? He looked to Hinata, his smirk growing. Something like that. Hinata repeated his words, a light demure giggle escaping her lips. Kiba eyed them for a moment before rolling his eyes. Well, whatever. Not really my business unless you're causing her trouble. He gave up and leaned back over the table. Since you're here actually, and since you've helped Hinata so much, I'll give you a heads up about a guy even you should avoid. Oh, Daiki's interest was piqued, though he already had a good guess as to who Kiba was about to warn him about. Kiba leaned forward over the table a bit more, to the point where he was literally hanging over Daiki's food and met his eyes, before flickering them briefly to the corner of the mess hall, and Akamaru on his head under his hood was directly in front of his face. 
directly where Gara was sitting out of the way. As expected, Daiki supposed they saw him in action in the Forest of Death. Daiki nodded, signaling Kiba he knew who he was talking about. That guy's crazy, he got thousands of sunbon tossed his way and didn't even blink. Just used some freaky sand jutsu to shield himself and it was so fast I could barely follow it. Kiba whispered lowly. He carries around his sand in that crazy gourd on his back and it stinks man. It absolutely reeks of blood. Even right now I can smell it. We saw him kill a team of three older rain ninja that seemed really tough. He just crushed them to death as his sand. It was brutal. To know how strong you are now dude. But I doubt even Sasuke could beat this guy. Information given, the dog ninja leaned back into his seat, and Daiki noted that Hinata and Shino were giving him their full attention as well as he digested Kiba's words. Hinata especially seemed to be waiting to see how he would reply to Kiba's words about the Jinchuriki of the one-tailed Shikaku. Oh, you mean raccoon boy? Daiki wasn't quiet at all as he replied and his voice traveled over the mess hall easily. Yeah, you're right about him being tough. Not someone any of you guys can take on. He's the youngest son of the Kazakage, and the hot blonde and guy with the painted face are his siblings. He noted in his peripheral vision, both Tamari and Kankuro tensing up, especially at the raccoon boy part. The teal eyes of Tamari met his own and were now wide with shock. Course, I'm different from you guys. He's not someone I can't kick around for fun. Daiki smirked boldly and didn't break eye contact with Tamari. If you go up against the other two though, the guy is a puppet user using chakra strings and probably poison while the hot blonde is a definitely a wind user. A bad matchup for any of you guys actually. He noticed Kankaro tense at his words and Tamari's wide-eyed gaze narrowed at him. He winked at her and turned away, looking at the three of teammate. You seem to know a lot about them. Hinata pointed out and he noticed there was now a small frown on her face. Mm, she must be really taking these guys seriously. I know a lot in general, he shrugged. But yeah, you guys should avoid taking them on. Well, beyond Puppet Boy, you and Shinobi are bad matchups for him after all as well. He added to the white-eyed girl. And he noticed then he was done with his food. Daiki stood up, his tray in hand. Right, well, fun as this has been, I may go train and grind this meat into my meat. Daiki said. He paused only to smirk at Hinata. You're welcome to grind on my meat anytime you want by the way. Shino's eyebrows rose up over his sunglasses in surprise. Kiba gaped gobsmacked. Hinata blinked and gave him a confused glance. Before her eyes widened as she apparently realized what he said, and a crimson red blush spread across her cheeks. Era era. She cupped her face once more though, surprising him. How forward Daikikuen. But if you need help with your meat, I may pop by your room later to help you with it. Daiki blinked. Stunned. Hinata? Kiba spluttered. Kiba's shock was enough to let him recover from his own and Daiki recovered his smirk. I'll hold you to that sweet number nine. He winked at her and left the table. Later. He bid them goodbye and went off to deposit his tray and leave the room. As he did, he noted once again all eyes were on him. And Gara in particular was glaring bloody murder at him. Leaking a heavy dose of killing intent. Scary not. He smirked at the redhead as he left. He had to at least get one taunt in on him, even if he was hoping to avoid putting the boot to his sand rodent giant. So this is Daiki Yuriaihim? The impassive voice of an elder woman mused aloud. There was no inclination was to what Kohara Yudatane felt in her voice as a gathering of high-ranking shinobi and kunoichi alike observed the boy making his way back to his provided room for his stay in Tower of the Forest of Death. Beside her, a frown was on the face of her teammate Hamura Mitokado, but he said nothing himself. Each of them were sat on either side of the third Hokage, who had a small amused smile on his face as he witnessed what just happened in the mess hall of the tower. Throughout the room, the staff of Shinobi and Kunoichi that oversaw the forest of death itself and the second round of the Chunin exams kept quiet. Even Anko, standing beside the screens showing off the feed from the cameras throughout the tower. His dash Kohura began, but she was cut off. The sound of wood echoed through the room as a cane was thrust into the floor hard. He's a fool. Danzo Shimaru spat, none too impressed. He just drew the eyes of the Kazakage's children, one of them an unstable Jinchuriki, knowingly at that, just so he could show off to a girl. His one unbandaged eye opened and he gave a disdainful glance at the Hokage. 
This is the one you have so much interest in? His disappointment could not be any more apparent. Haruzan's smile grew. As always, you have such a narrow view on things my old friend. He replied voice casual and not at all bothered by his disdain. I assume you're annoyed at the fact he so easily revealed what he knew in front of them at that? Of course, any advantage he could glean from that is now lost. Danzo scoffed. Talented he may be, but talent means nothing without the proper mind set to utilize it. You're looking at it all wrong, Haruzan chuckled, shaking his head in amusement. That wasn't a mistake. Daiki knows exactly what he'd done. While he was indeed showing off to young Hinata, that was not all he was doing. He was getting in their heads, telling them he knows exactly what they can do and he is not impressed. They in turn know nothing of his abilities and will work themselves into quite the tizzy no doubt over trying to counter him. Pure arrogance? Danzo scoffed, unperturbed by the reply he got. That boy Gara, he's as unstable as they come and his seal is pitifully weak. He can allow the Achibi out to run amok at a moment's notice. Yet this boy sees no threat in him. Last I checked, three tails beats one, Haruzan smugly pointed out. And of course Daiki has full control over the Sanbai and works together with it. Young Gara can only let the beast itself run rampant. The Shikaku is no match for Daiki and the Sanbai together. So you say, Danzo huffed, I have yet to see any proof of this wonder boy you have been telling tall tales of and giving such special treatment to having any control over the beast at all. And even if he did, defeating the Shikaku would be no simple matter. The damage it would cost when being brought down would be catastrophic if released within the village. We're not in the village old man. Daiki's voice echoed from the speakers connected to the camera feed. So stop your whining. Everyone froze, Danzo included at the sudden interruption. Everyone bar the Hokage himself though who merely chuckled even louder. For a moment nobody said a thing. Such was the surprise at the sudden interruption. Danzo was the one who found his voice first. Well, beyond the Hokage that was, you can hear us? He asked surprise evident in his tone despite how he tried to hide it. His one singular eye open wide. I can see the entirety of this forest and whatever I can see, I can hear, that includes you guys sitting up top in the tower thinking you're all mysterious and observing everyone. Daiki scoffed. The Kazakage's children aren't a problem, I could beat all three of them, even Gara. his ability to bring out the Achibi isn't a problem, we're far enough away from the village that I'd have room to clown on it, and I wouldn't let it get that far anyway. I'd seal it off before he ever got the chance. Yes, that indeed. Hiruzen helpfully added. The amusement plain on his face at seeing his old rival be berated by a child. I was unaware of such an ability. Dear Sarutobi apparently didn't see fit to inform me of such. Danzo quickly regained his calm and gazed dryly with his singular eye at the Hokage. Hiruzen just gave him a pleasant smile. Well, I didn't think you needed to know. You are after all supposed to be on house arrest he pointed out unrepentantly. I only allowed you out to indulge Kaharu and Hamura when they asked after I revealed we had a little chat and invited them here. Humph, Danzo sniffed, looking away from the Hokage and looking to the screens and the boy taking central stage within them who was now leaning against one of the walls of the hall he was in, arms crossed and casually looking up. Be that as it may, it is still a risk you foolishly and arrogantly took without needing to. Cool story, bro. Daiki scoffed and many of the gathered shinobi outright goggled at his disrespect to one of the honored elders of Kanoha. Also, just for your knowledge, I wasn't just showing off for Hinata. I was showing off to Tamari as well. She's pretty hot, isn't she? It'd be cool to bang a Kage's daughter, I'm thinking. Bro? Those gathered in the viewing room had the distinct and ever so rare opportunity to see Danzo Shimura completely lose his composure and sputter in shock confusion and a not so little helping of disbelief. Anko snorted and the Hokage's chuckles turned into full-on laughter. Do... Do you not understand the meaning of respect, boy? Danzo couldn't help but ask, goggling at at his sheer arrogance to talk to a man of his stature like that. Do you? Daiki countered an instant later. I mean, you were happily running your mouth about me right there without understanding or even knowing a fraction of what I can do. And for the record, yes, I can full-on use the Sanbai's chakra as I please and I can enter Bijou mode at will. I just don't show that off because that would be stupid to advertise, unless you think that's a good idea or something. Silence. Danzo had absolutely nothing to say in return. 
The old man's hand tightened over his cane and his lips trembled as he looked and tried to find words with which to reply, and failed utterly. Try not to bully Danzo too much, he's a feeble old man these days Daikikuen. Haruzen replied in his stead, smile still on his face. Also, maybe try not to broadcast your multiple-tailed friends so openly, hmm? Those in here can be trusted not to let this information leak, and know as such, but not everyone has the training the ninja in this room have when it comes to guarding secrets. Fair enough, Daiki shrugged. I only brought it up because you guys were already talking about it and obviously already know, and Anko I told personally, oh by the way, hey pony girl, he waved at the camera. You really need to work on that tact brat. Anko shook her head. Pony girl? You foo foo. I sense an interesting story there. Hiruzen giggled in interest, without any shame at all despite those gathered in the room. Hamura sighed, and Koharu rolled her eyes, well aware of her teammate of multiple decades' perverted side. Hiruzen, really, must you? The old woman asked. The Hokage shrugged. She offered to let me ride her like a pony if I fixed that hickey on her neck. Daiki shamelessly and proudly replied. Dozens of eyes swept over to Anko and gave her a series of stunned looks, the Hokage and Danzo included. In return she shrugged. I'd do pretty much anything to loosen the hold Orochimaru has on me or get rid of. It. He's offering one better. Anko admitted aloud. The horny little brat has been pretty upfront about wanting to bang me. If it motivates him and lets him accomplish what he promised, I'll happily do it. Hmm. Interesting, tell me more. Hiruzen leaned forward in his seat, wiping his nose discreetly. Yes, I quite agree, but on your ability to deal with the cursed seal, not your shameless lustful ways. Koharu was quick to jump in. And I do hope, young man, that you aren't so easily led astray by some female skin as you seem to be, strong and talented you may be, an understatement, but even a Jinchuriki will have trouble surviving getting their throats slit after they are led astray by the first pair of large breasts or long legs that try to seduce them outside the village. That wouldn't kill me, Daiki shrugged. But fair enough. So Anko has filled you guys in on the situation with the curse seal. She has. Hamura inclined his head simply, speaking for the first time. Right? Well, you probably already know the specifics of what I told her then, Daiki hummed. To get to the point, the real problem with the curse seals are the shards of Orochimaru's soul in them. I can project myself into the seals if it comes to that, but I'll have to fight that shard of Orochimaru and kill it. It won't be anywhere near as hard to kill as the real Orochimaru, because it only has a fraction of his chakra and as such won't be able to use his full power, and I'll be able to use my full power while I'm at it. I'm confident I can do so, but I'm covering my bases first, and learning how he fights and his jutsu from Anko just to make sure. At the mention of his traitorous student, Haruzen sobered, a frown appearing on his face. How far that boy has fallen. He shook his head in dismay. Still, we may benefit from this. Anko was once one of our brightest and most talented. A rival of Kakashi in talent. If not for that seal, she may have become even stronger than him. There was a reason after all. Why one such as Orochimaru had specifically sought her out to take as his own personal apprentice. That is nice. But I'll take not being able to use my full strength and chakra over being brainwashed by this damn seal any day of the week. Enko shrugged. You won't be waiting much longer, Hiruzen promised. I'll be personally overseeing Daiki's training during the month leading up to the final rounds of the Chunin exams. It was a grand reveal, and it silenced the entire room once more. The fact that the Hokage and legendary professor was personally going to be training the boy. You? You can't be serious? Danzo hissed. I see you clocked on old friend. Still quick even in your old age, at least sometimes I suppose. Hiruzen chuckled. You want to make this brat Hokage? Danzo demanded. And shock filled the faces of all others within the room. I do. Hiruzen replied simple with a single nod in confirmation. Haruzen, truly? Is that wise? Hamura asked, turning to look at his old friend and Koharu nodded in agreement. Yes, for his age he is strong, and his potential is mind-boggling. His ability to reach the level of strength needed is not in question I dare say, she brought up. But he is so very young still, he has yet to come close his to his maturity and inexperience still. 
things that he will gain in time and I dare say myself that I am not in any danger of suddenly dying anytime soon, Hiruzen pointed out. I will be training him myself personally, and will be promoting him straight to Jonin once these exams finish. Coming to the aid of Team 7 and driving off my former student is proof enough of his ability to hold the position. Daiki on the screen gave a bit of a start at the old man's words. But nobody noticed since everyone's attention was on the Hokage and the extremely shocking information he was revealing. After all, everyone within the room was there to hear the Sandame Hokage's personal choice on who would become the Godame Hokage. History in the making. Foolish. Danzo scoffed. Strength and experience? Paltry, what we need is a leader that can make the hard choices. Should he become Hokage, it will be revealed that he is a Jinchuriki of a bijou belonging to another village. Mist will bark, though they are toothless now so do not matter. But stone and cloud, they will threaten and encircle us. Threatened by us possessing another bijou at our beck and call. What will he do then? Placate? A child that has not seen war, has no right to be ho dash. I'll destroy their villages if they try it. Daiki cut him off. Thanks to my eyes, I can mask my chakra entirely. Non consents or see my chakra unless I allow it. Even when using the Sanbai's chakra, I can get into any of their villages without them any the wiser and transform into the Sanbai itself and unleash a Bijudama right in the center of their villages. I'll wipe them out and then leave and that's it. Now will you shut up? Old man Hokage's word is law. So stop your damn whining about it before I decapitate you. I'm sick of your voice already. Danzo was stunned into silence by the threat and proclamation of intent against their enemies. There was absolutely nothing he could say against that. Hiruzen. Is he actually capable of such a thing? Koharu asked. Indeed, very much so. The Hokage nodded. Though that should be a very last option Daikikuen I'd like to have you agree with. Wanton killing on that scale is not something one should so casually decide on. Once again, shock prevailed over all else for most of the room. Wide-eyed stares turning to look at the boy on the screen at the Hokage's confirmation. Well obviously, Daiki snorted. I've got no problem killing enemy Shinobi or Kunoichi, but killing civilians isn't pleasant at all. Sickening really. That's just for if Stone or Cloud tried to push their nonsense like they have before. I'll let them see that I can push back harder. I rescind my previous statement and apologize, Danzo added a moment later as the boy finished. I will not go back on my words that the boy is arrogant and his inexperience shines brightly, but if he has the will to back up those words, then he is a much better candidate than Jiraiya or Kakashi, they wouldn't have the stomach for such a thing, see that you don't soften that edge Hiruzen. I will try my best. Hiruzen replied, blatantly rolling his eyes. Because of course threatening genocide was what won the boy Danzo's favor. Lovely. Well, if even Danzo is agreeing with you now, then there is nothing much I can do to convince otherwise, Koharu sighed in defeat. We will have to make sure the boy matures though, that is for sure. I'm still here you know. Daiki pointed out at her words. However could I forget? The old woman responded dryly. Heh, I like you lady. Daiki snorted. Too bad you ain't young anymore. I've seen a picture of you in the records, you were pretty hot. I wouldn't have minded you in your younger years helping me mature, if you know what I'm saying. Koharu palmed her face. You are a Cretan rivaled only by Jiraiya. Thanks. Daiki shamelessly grinned. Now, I've got training to get back to. Need to throw myself back into the grind. So I can get even swoller and then I may go all Tobarama on these biatches in the exam and make Kanoha great again. With that said, the boy on the screen pushed up off the wall, his head lowering and looking ahead of him and more or less letting them know he was done speaking. Grind? Swole? Koharu was utterly lost. I don't understand. What does that mean? And why is he bringing Sensei's name into this? A personal quirk of the boys, the grind is what he calls training. Grinding at a whetstone I assume and swole. I'm not sure, but I believe it has something to with his muscles. Hiruzen stroked his chin and hummed. As for the mention of Tobarama sensei it is a joke I'm led to believe that he first started using with young Sasuke Kuen because of Tobarama sensei's wariness of the Uchiha. Humph! Hamura snorted. Tobarama sensei would have been amused. That is not the point. Koharu shook her head. To use the honored Naidame Hokage's name like that, how disrespectful can one boy be? 
You should look into giving the boy lessons in etiquette before he mouths off to someone and starts a war. The older generation fell into a discussion of the boy, and Anko watched on blankly. Ha, huh, who knew the kid was actually such a big shot? She mused. When he returned to his room, Daiki got straight back to the grind. There wasn't a lot of room. He so ended up sealing all the furniture of the bedroom inside his Dimension Force seal to free up some space. Even then, it wasn't exactly much to work with, it was a small 13 feet by 13 feet space after all. He could jump to Isabu's dimension and leave a clone behind at any time, but he decided not to. He had the camera in his room covered so none could watch him, but he couldn't be sure of just when somebody would next seek him out. Somebody that a simple shadow clone wouldn't fool easily, especially after his little mouthing off episode against Danzo. I should have 6967 just kept my mouth shut. 6968. But the guy just pisses me off. 6969. Hey, nice. He mused inwardly as he went through one-handed handstand push-ups. If there was ever someone that should have retard branded across their forehead, it was Danzo Shimura. The amount of crap Daiki would have to take care of in the future just because of that moron's absolutely massive mess-ups was insane. The two most blatant being finding a way to make sure Sasuke didn't go full on Avenger and want to destroy the leaf after he eventually found out the truth of the Uchiha massacre and deal with Nagato, or as he called himself now, Pain. Pain who got the better of Sage Mode Naruto even with help. Far from Naruto's strongest form come the end Daiki mused, but monstrous all the same. A simple clone of Naruto in Sage Mode defeated the third Rakage. The third Rakage whom fought Yuki, the eight-tailed bijou to a draw. Even with Isabu backing him up, and the time he had, that was going to be a hell of a level to reach. And all because of Danzo. That wasn't even getting into the fact if he wasn't such an utter clown, the entire Uchiha clan would still be around right now, brainwashed to be loyal, and he'd have the strength of Itachi and Shursui to count on. Now that would be a lineup he could get behind. Daiki himself, Naruto, Sasuke, Itachi, Shursui, Hiruzen Saratobi, Jiraiya, Tsunade, Kakashi, Guy. Granted Tsunade was a long shot, but with all of them even barring her, Orochimaru wouldn't have dared start his crap like he was doing now. Hell, Sand wouldn't have the balls to either. So yes, when he was keeping track of those watching him and he found Danzo running his mouth about him, Daiki couldn't stop from cutting in and flexing all over the old prick. The oddest thing of it all though, well one of them at least, was the fact that Danzo backed down after Daiki threatened to cut his head off for backtalking the Hokage and admitting his big plan for making the likes of Stone and Cloud back down if they threatened war if things really did spiral on towards the road of him becoming Hokage. It was a simple, yet incredibly genius stratagem if he did say so himself. Threatened to Bijudama them. After infiltrating the village and letting them know not a single person could sense or find him if he so desired. If he wanted to disappear, there really was nobody that could stop him and they couldn't stop him from coming and going either, not without bringing down a fully realized Bijou mode perfect Jinchuriki. He'd be showing off a bunch of his cards if it came to it, which he'd rather keep close to the chest, but if it came down to it, he'd do it. He wouldn't allow A and Anoki to dig their teeth in and shake him for all they could like they did the sand aim when the leaf was still recovering and had to play nice. No, he'd just go to the opposite end and go full genocide if he had to. That apparently was something Danzo could get behind though, and he literally retracted complaint about Daiki being in line to be the next Hokage. And wasn't that a bother? With all of the people there in the room during the reveal, including the Hokage's advisors and Danzo, it was pretty much official that he was now being groomed for the Hokage hat. He couldn't take that back now even if he tried. It would be a total bad look for him. So he now had no option but to run straight down that path and make sure Old Man Third lived through the Kanoha Crush if he didn't want to find himself the leader of the Land of Fire. The workload wouldn't really be a problem with his clones. The big issue was that he wouldn't exactly be able to leave the village much since he would be the leader. Which meant a bunch of things that he couldn't just send others to fetch for him would be out of his reach. Especially one of the most important of all. The Ryamakyu, the Dragon Veins a massive source of powerful chakra comparable to a bijou in scope, sealed beneath the ruins of the city Roran in the Land of Rivers, close to the border of the Land of Wind. And for all intents and purposes, what he planned to use to empower Isabu and make him even stronger. Hmm, so that's what your full big plan is to make me stronger? You've been tight-lipped about it and even hiding most of your thoughts from me about it. 
I admit you had me curious, Isabu hummed. Converting all that chakra into my own would take a significant amount of time. Time you would not have to freely spend outside the village as Hokage. Exactly, so unless he got access to a teleportation jutsu like the Flying Thunder God, he was in a sticky situation on that front if the Sandame died. Well, you could always send an amped clone over there and have it absorb the chakra with your torso armor and the infinite armor and transfer it directly to you and then you could filter it through to me, Isabu pointed out. Though, I'm unsure if even the pair of them could handle all of that chakra, and multiple trips might need to be made. Um, well, that could be an option. And it wasn't like his clones had some limited range they could go from him. After all, they were in a literal separate dimension right now and he still got their memories and chakra if they popped. And he could handle some of the chakra carrying himself thanks to the chakra absorption seal he'd added to the dimension force seal. Still being confined to the village would suck. And that wasn't a euphemism for his own mighty, epically big member. And besides beyond that, there were a bunch of other things he wanted to get his hands on. Like a demonic hydra and its army of 8,000 stone golems that could each tank a Raisingan to the face without trouble. I mean, I could lend my full power to a clone of yours and they would have no issue beating down this Moroku. Isabu pointed out. Daiki grimaced. It would take all the fun out of things though just sending my clones off to do everything for me. I want to run around, beat up demons, seduce priestesses and princesses and have fun. He burst out, full on whining. Then have an amped clone stay back in the village and you go out, simple as that. Isabu deadpanned. Damn it, this guy had an answer for everything. It's called common sense, though I can understand that being a foreign phrase to you, with you being, well you. Isabu snorted. Common sense? That sounded like something only a little pansy would leave. There was a knock on the door cutting of Daiki's thoughts and he sighed. Cutting off the mental conversation with his inner spirit tortoise, he pushed himself up to land on his feet and made his way over the door. As he expected, someone had come to visit him. Night had fallen now and the other genin had returned to their own assigned rooms. He'd been training for hours at this point. The only question was who? Well, he could just look through the door itself and see. But that would take the fun out of it. Who will it be? He mused, grasping the doorknob. Hinata? Danzo? Old Man Third? Anko maybe? Daiki pulled the door open and blinked at whom he saw. It wasn't anyone he expected at all. A tall cream-skinned sandy blonde with glacial teal eyes. Her hair done up in four pigtails and adorned in a short pale pink dress with fishnet underneath. Tamari of the Hidden Sand. I'm not gonna lie, Daiki said in lieu of greeting leaning on the doorframe and smirking at the older girl. You were the last person I expected to come visit little old me. Tamari glared at him. Were you expecting Gara instead? She challenged. Ooh, how feisty. Kitty came with her claws unsheathed, he saw. Not really actually, but I'd still see raccoon boy coming my way before you. Daiki shrugged before taking an idle sweeping glance around with his eyes, peering through the walls all around him. Kankaro wasn't anywhere nearby. In fact, he was downstairs in one of the bathrooms working doing what appeared to be maintenance on his puppets. Weird place to do so, but he wouldn't judge. It seemed Big Sis waited for her little brother to be occupied before slinking away to stealthily confront him. My how scandalous. Tamari grimaced at his words. You know? She uttered those two words simply, eyes narrowing even more. Heh. If she compressed her gaze any further she might end up firing beams of chakra at him. Pew pew. Know what? His smirk grew tauntingly. I mean you'll have to be more specific. I know a lot of things. How to get strong quick. How to taunt like nobody's business. The meaning of the life. The color of your undies. Green looks good on you by the way. How to make a mean protein filled breakfast that's great for growing muscle. And of course everything about their little plan. More than her even considering she didn't know her father was currently a rotting corpse right now. Or would be soon. Tamari's face scrunched up in confusion. Completely taken aback by his reply before shaking his head. Don't take me for a fool. Besides, you're completely wrong. My undies are blue. She huffed. His smirk grew to large proportions. Blue huh? Good to know. He nodded. He could have of course just looked through her clothing at any time. But where was the fun in that? It would be way too easy. Tamari blinked, suddenly realizing just what he'd gotten her to reveal. But to his surprise, instead of getting angry about it or raging, she sighed and rolled her eyes. 
You're one arrogant, smart Alec kid. Has anyone ever told you that? She responded, voice dry. Something like that. There's this one Jonin. She's all about me being all arrogant. He shrugged. I have no interest in your sex life, kid. Tamari caught on instantly and rolled her eyes again. Now may I come in? I want to speak to you about what you were so casually throwing around earlier about me and my siblings. Huh, and here you thought I was hot earlier, Daiki pointed out. But sure, come on in. Far be it for me to refuse letting such a pretty girl in my room, however temporary. He pushed off the door frame and stepped aside, gesturing for her to do so. Tamari entered and gave him a real surprised look. How did you know that? She asked, startled. You just told me, he replied smugly. He didn't even need to reveal the fact he read her thoughts earlier for that. Damn Kanoha brat. Tamari glared at him once more, losing that cool facade she had on her face. Eh, riling her up would be fun for sure. Tamari shook her head and released a deep breath, regaining her cool, and then stopped and stared, confused as she saw the state of his room for the duration of his stay. That being the fact that it was completely empty. What the hell is with your room? Tamari looked over her shoulder to give him an odd glance. Did you toss out all of the furniture? I stored it in a ceiling space actually, Daiki informed the sandy blonde. It was getting in the way of training you see. Can't let precious time that I can dedicate to the grind go to waste. He explained and clenched one fist while curling his arm, making his bicep pop out vividly. Big, round, and powerful, the fully visible veins trailing down just highlighting the power within these grind-gained muscles. You're training in the middle of an exam? She asked incredulously, but her eyes were locked on his arm, before she managed to drag her gaze away and up to look him in the eyes. Of course I am. You don't expect me to sit around doing nothing like some lazy bum, do you? It was Daiki's turn to give her an incredulous stare. Seriously? Do you know how much I can get done in four days? Four days was enough to make his physical stats go up by two. Though, considering how much harder it was making them go up the stronger he got, that may soon go down to one and below that even. By his estimates, by time he broke the 400 mark, it would take over a week of high-intensity training just to go up a single physical point, if not more, and it would only get even harder from there. And that wasn't even getting into the fact that with his clones, he could master multiple jutsu in just a span of four days. As it was though, he needed to take advantage of every single day he had at his disposal. Not a single one could be wasted without gaining something from it. Otherwise, by time things really started to roll downhill, he wouldn't be able to keep up at all. Tamari raised an eyebrow. Rest is important between training as well, she pointed out. Especially with the fact that if this is anything like any other Chunin exams, there will be an exam after this one with full-on head-to-head -head combat. It could be one versus one, or it could even be team versus team, and I don't think I need to explain which one would be bad for you, being all alone and all. Rest is important for muscle and fatigue recover and recovering chakra. Daiki nodded in agreement. I'm just built different than your average guy, though. I only need a fraction of the time anyone else would need. An hour at best to recover from intense training that would leave you gaping in awe. Hell, technically speaking, he didn't even need to sleep. Isabu could charge his body at any time and wash away any physical fatigue quite easily. Or at least, he could go massive amounts of time without sleep thanks to that if he so desired. He didn't mind you, mostly because mental fatigue was still a thing that would grind him down and throw him off of his game, and he actually liked sleeping. Especially since he sprung for a really, really comfortable mattress not long ago, and his sheets were such soft, lovely silk who said only nobles and rich clan punks got to enjoy the finer things in life. He was the Sanbai Jinchuriki Lord Daikisama. As nice as it is that you're so proud of being my Jinchuriki, you're going way off track. Isabu deadpanned. All right. Nobody likes a braggart. Well, either way it isn't my problem if you screw yourself over in the long run. Tamari shrugged, turning away from him and idly glancing over the empty room they were in. Now, enough of the snark and sarcasm. I came here to talk to you for a reason. If you want to see me unclothed, it'll cost you. He quipped with a snort, eyes tracing over her back, and not actually leering at the curvature of her hips and the swell of her petite giant cheeks through that dress of hers, but rather taking in the folded form of her giant fan. With his eyes, he could see deep into the makeup of the weapon, 
The metal of it was lined with chakra or wind chakra or at that. He knew enough to recognize the look of it now since he had a few blades made of the stuff himself, and there were some interesting seals inscribed within it. Shoddy work to be honest, even Orochimaru's hack seal was much higher on the scale, the seal matrix wasn't even locked, but intuitive and quite interesting. From his idle inspection, it seemed that it was a seal to amplify wind chakra. Probably to make up for the fact that only about 30% or so of the fan's metal was wind chakra or... By time Tamari turned back around, eyes rolling at his quip, he'd already memorized the seal matrix and made a mental note to improve upon it and edit it to make seals that amplified all the other elements while he was at it. It would make a good reference for deciphering the seal work within the Kiba blades. You know, you're hot kid, I won't lie, but you're not that hot, Tamari scoffed. Now, let's stop dancing around the topic. How do you know about my brother? She demanded. Daiki smirked and opened his mouth. Gara, not Kankaro before you give me the runaround again. She cut him off before he could say anything. Uh, was he that predictable? Or was she just that smart? Guess the joke about his war paint, being makeup he stole from Tamari herself would have to be sheathed for another time. Well, whatever, ruin his fun, why doesn't she? Who doesn't know about your brother? Daiki rolled his eyes and crossed his arms. Anyone who knows what a Jinchuriki is, and is smart knows who the Bijou holders are. They were war deterrents for a reason. Killer B, Yujito, Han and Rashi were all in the bingo books for heaven's sake. And if Fu was to be believed, she was in the IWA version of the bingo book. She liked to brag about that fact sometimes, since he wasn't in any official bingo books. Yet, hell, your brother is a running joke, Daiki added with a snort, at least to him. A joke? Gara is a joke. Tamari goggled at him, gobsmacked. Of course he is. Daiki barked a laugh. Look at the state of him. If there was ever a picture-perfect example of a failure of a Jinchuriki, your little brother would be right on the money. The gobsmacked look faded quickly and Tamari glared at him hotly. Gara is the greatest weapon of the hidden sand village. The only person capable of defeating him is our father, the Kazakage. She spat angrily, the disrespect against her little brother bringing out what appeared to be a protective rage. You were bragging to your little Lee friends earlier in the mess hall and throwing little digs at him. Don't think I didn't notice, but you're nothing compared to Gara. He's near unbeatable, and not someone a mere leaf genin could ever hope to even scratch. The fact he's the greatest weapon of your village while he's so weak is the funniest part of it all. It makes your village look like a giant circus. Daiki shot back, jutting his chin out at her defiantly, egging her on. And your father the Kazakage is the big lead clown. Big honking red nose and all, honk honk. You! Tamari floundered looking for words to fire back. But the sheer insult he levied at her village. Her brother and father all at once stunned her mightily. Where do you get off? I think you'd be better at getting me off hot stuff, Daiki retorted. Besides, you obviously can't tell me you don't see it. You seem like a smart chick. See what? She ground her teeth and commanded him to reveal. Go on. Tell me what obvious answer I seem to be missing, you overly horny little fool. He's got it tattooed on his forehead. If that wasn't a cry for help then I don't know what is. He answered with a scoff. Love, your brother's a psycho from sheer loneliness and questioning his worth all his life. That's what happens to kids avoided and treated like a demon all their life. And he is weak, mentally and physically. He relies on the power of his bijou. And that won't do anything against me. Tamari didn't reply. Her hands were clenched at her side so hard they shook, and she continued to glare at him, but she had no words to refute him. He could see the realization in her eyes. Of course, it isn't your fault and not your village's either really, Daiki shrugged. Dear old Papa Kazakage is to blame, both for the joke your village has become and the running laugh anyone high up has about your brother being some ultimate weapon. Hell, that twat Raza sent off Pakura to her death, pretty much the strongest ninja of Sunabar himself. The sandy pig-tailed blonde grimaced. Your brother is a failure of a Jinchuriki because he doesn't control the power of his bijou. It controls him. Daiki pushed on. Do you know what you need to control the power of a bijou? Willpower. That's it. It's a simple thing, but something your little brother utterly lacks in because he has nothing. He's utterly alone in the world. As such, he has nothing worth fighting for besides himself. He has no hobbies. 
He can't sleep because of that trashy seal holding the one tail and he has nobody to make his life worth living. And because of that, he's only got a fraction of the strength he would have and like that, he's not even close to a match for me. His words shook Tamari so much, the sandy blonde actually stuttered back a step away from him. How do you know all this? She couldn't help but ask in a whisper. It seemed the home truths he'd dropped on her had rocked her core. Well, she was the one that came here demanding answers over a few taunts and bragging statements. Please, this isn't shocking to know at all. Daiki rolled his eyes. Everyone in your village pretty much knows this and so any visitor learns it easily. And everyone in the elemental nations knows your father is so pathetic the wind daimyo is coming to Kanoha for mission requests. Then again... How can one expect a clown to lead an entire village of tens of thousands when he can't even care for his own damn son? Tamari's eyes were horrified for all of a few seconds at his words, before she closed her eyes for a moment, took a deep breath and centered herself. Annoyingly, your words aren't wrong. I've long been unhappy with Gara's treatment, and your words have merit behind them. She admitted and then crossed her arms and stared him in the eye. True as a lot of it has been, Gara has the full power of the Shikaku at his fingertips and the ultimate defense. You've yet to provide any proof of your strength and ability to beat him. Just ran your mouth a lot. Her self-control was quite impressive. If I end up fighting Gara, I'll gladly prove how much stronger I am than him. Daiki shrugged. Unless that is, you want to make me prove my strength right here and now? In response, Tamari smirked. Finally, that's what I came here for in the first place. A little test to see if you're all talk or not. Her hand went up over her shoulder grasping the heavy metal base of her fan, and then in a blur, she pulled it over her shoulder and swung it at him. A single step back made sure it swept right through the area where his face was a moment ago. Oh, not bad. Daiki blinked and found himself complimenting. By his estimates, with how much metal was compressed into that giant fan, and the size of it, it had to be at least 150 pounds in weight and she swung it around like a light stick at blurring speeds. Tamari's eyes narrowed and she said nothing, instead palming the base of the giant fan with her other hand and expertly twirling it like a staff with both hands like a helicopter blade and lashed out at him in a blindingly fast barrage of melee strikes. She was impressively strong, fast and skilled in close combat for a long-range specialist, that was for sure. Yet, despite that, Daiki barely moved an inch from where he stood as he ducked and weaved around her strikes. He was just that much faster than her and could see the next move coming before she even fully started with it. He also wasn't that nice of a guy that he would let some girl from another village attack him in his own village without consequence. Or in any other village for that matter. He also, for example, could seal his weights away in an instant, becoming 20,000 pounds lighter. He ducked under one strike and then moved. Tamari's eyes widened as he outright disappeared from her vision. That was how fast he moved. And then a ripping sound filled the room and Daiki appeared behind her. A familiar pale pink dress in hand. Eyeing her from behind with a smirk on his face. His eyes greedily taking in the sight of her firm. Round behind clad in only fishnet. And a powder blue lingerie that looked ever so delicious on her hips. It took Tamari a second to realize what happened, and she whirled around, eyes wide in shock. You how? She gaped, not even bothering to cover her front and showing off her near enough fully exposed melons to him. I'm just that F.A. Dash he began answering, eyes on her chest and memorizing their shape and every contour. He tilted his head to the side as Tamari tried to smash his head in with her fan while he was busy answering and ogling her. Teach. She clicked her tongue in annoyance. Well, you're not shy, that's for sure. Daiki laughed. She literally used his distraction in ogling her and replying to try and smash his head in. Good on her. I'm a kunoichi, and not one like those little girls you hang around with that would lock up or get embarrassed over a little nudity. Tamari huffed, slamming her fan into the ground beside her and leaning on it. Looks like you're not just all talk, I guess. Not that this little bout was all that impressive. I'm a ninjutsu specialist. I'm just good enough and close to get by. You know, it's actually not that hard to compliment people. Daiki snorted. Like for example, hey Tamari, you have some really nice Ds. They look real soft and I bet would feel real good in my hands. You'll have to just wonder about that. Tamari rolled her eyes and then held out her hand. Give me my dress. How about no? Daiki countered and lifted it up, idly spinning it in the air above his head. 
I think I'll keep it. Tamari stared at him for a moment before huffing. Whatever, I've done what I came here to do. She replied and boldly turned around and walked towards the door, opening it, not caring at all that she was half-dressed for the most part. She paused just before she stepped out and looked over her shoulder at him. Keep the dress if you want. It might make your last few dreams memorable before you get crushed by Gara after needling him like you did. He has his eyes on you now. And then she boldly left the room behind and walked down the hall to her own. Daiki watched directly through the walls as she did. Ha! Huh. He blinked. That was not at all how he expected that to go when he pulled the dress off of her. Granted, she didn't exactly have far to go to get to her room, and nobody was around to see her, especially with her brothers not being in her room. Well, she was... interesting. Impressive as her figure was, Daiki found himself more impressed by her mental resiliency. He dropped quite a few bombs of revelation on her and she was while shocked and overwhelmed initially, was quick to regain her cool. Chucking. He walked over and closed the door, idly examining the dress in his hands. How fun! He mused. Just then, there was a puff of smoke at his side and Daiki looked up from the pale pink dress in his hands to look over in surprise. When the smoke faded, a familiar pink scaled chameleon came into view. Though she was a lot smaller than usual. Toka? Daiki blinked in surprise. Why are you so small? Because I felt like it, and obviously I couldn't enter such a narrow space at my full size, no? Toka replied as if such a thing were obvious. I wouldn't exactly be very good at stealth and infiltrating at my usual size now, would I? You can change your size? Daiki's eyes widened. That was obvious for sure with her here and now, but it was very interesting to know. A staple of the Chameleon Clan, though we can only shrink and return to our full sizes, a reverse application of that same jutsu those Akimichi of your village tend to use, Toka shrugged, something you'll no doubt learn in the future. Once you can match up to the sensing ability of the whelps of our clan, that is, without relying on those silly eyes of yours. Ha, huh, neat, he could think of so many ways to use that kind of thing. You jealous you don't have eyes as badass as mine? He taunted her. Toka rolled her eyes and scoffed. Hardly. Unlike you, I don't need to rely on a crutch for something so simple. She fired back. Gah! Right in the pride. Daiki coughed. So, what's up? He changed the topic. For no reasons, he just felt like it. 100% truth. Totally. She rolled her ripple-like eyes again but didn't call him out on it and instead walked over and hopped up onto his shoulder, perching on it comfortably. Right now, she was about ten inches long at most. Show me your hand. She ordered him. What a demanding little lizard princess. Daiki did his bid and held up his hand. So why do you dash he began asking, only for his eyes to widen as she opened her mouth and extended her long tongue out and dropped a small glowing green pebble into his palm. This is... He gaped in shock. I took the liberty of grabbing the stone you wanted from that ferret, and as you planned, I left behind a small fragment of it within the annoying little beast to keep it alive. Toka explained. I thought I'd save the trouble of bringing it back here to you then taking it back as you initially intended. Daiki said nothing and just stared in shock at the fragment from the stone of Jellal in his hand. Then slowly he started to chuckle and before long he threw his head back and released a full-bellied laughter that echoed through the room bouncing off the walls and reverberating, ominously. I see by your demented laugh that you are pleased. Toka commented idly, making him shut up. Hey, my laugh is powerful and intimidating, not demented, he growled. You keep telling yourself that, the pink chameleon snorted. By the way, that clan was a decent challenge to find, though we found them traveling through the land of rivers, and interestingly, not far from them, I came across an odd ancient temple that the old man you told me of seemed to be trying to avoid. Daiki's eyes widened. Wait, it's not in another continent. It's here? He thought, shocked. And not only that, but it was in the land of rivers as well? No seriously, what the hell was up with the land of rivers and all the good stuff there? It should seriously be renamed to the land of loot for crying out loud. This, this is good. Daiki couldn't help but give out another ominous not demented laughter. When he got around to having Isabu slurp up the Raimaku, he could go after the Jellal stone veins as well, which should be comparable to the Raimaku itself as well. With the Ryumaku and the Jellal stone veins, could he perhaps 
not become a match for Karama? Unlikely, going by your memories, while both together will give me quite the boost, I believe it best. I will gain power comparable to Chomei. And as you know, Chomei doesn't come close to the power of Karama. Isabu dashed those hopes. Yeah, Chomei got their butts clapped by Karama. Even with Son Goku, Saiken, Kokuo, Matatabi and Isabu himself backing them up. And that was only half power Karama. But still, that would be a significant jump in power regardless. And there was always other avenues to explore. For now though, it was time to put some more plans into motion. Such as sealing this fragment of Jellal inside his heavenly star seal. His chakra had changed color again. Originally, cliché as it was, his chakra was a light cyan blue. Also ironic considering he disliked light blue because it gave him headaches in his other life when looking at it too long. It wasn't a bad color really, but he didn't like large swathes of it and preferred it merely for decoration trimming and such. When he became the Jinchuriki of Isabu and his chakra coils became constantly exposed to Isabu's own, his chakra not only became denser, but darked in color becoming a dark blue. Much more his style. When he gained the cursed seal and absorbed all the chakra of Orochimaru's soul fragment, his chakra darkened once more, becoming a royal purple, which then became an even darker purple after he remodeled the cursed seal into the heavenly star seal. Now though, Hours after his meeting with Tamari and Toka returned to him, the color of his chakra had radically shifted once more. Now, after sealing the stone or rather fragment of Jellal into the heavenly star seal on his shoulder and setting it up the in the same way as the star chakra, the color of Daiki's own chakra had shifted into a dark green that seemed to almost border on gray. Timber green, actually. Isabu helpfully corrected him as he stood in the middle of his provided bedroom for the next few days a blaze of chakra covering his hand and examining it in interest. Timber Green. Huh? Not a bad name for chakra of a leaf ninja. Daiki snorted in amusement. Still, it wasn't like he could complain at all. It wasn't like the change of color in his chakra was a bad thing. Quite the opposite, it had become even more dense and powerful, and on top of that, much easier to control. He supposed that made sense considering that loser Hato learned to control the power from the Stone of Jellal extremely quickly after getting a hold of it. And it wasn't just his chakra that felt stronger and easier to control. His body itself felt like it had grown quite a decent bit stronger over the last few hours after he got used to the influx of power from the Fragment of Jellal. And his healing factor was amped massively as well. He'd slashed his hand not long ago to check and it had sizzled and healed up within seconds. Jinchuriki healing factor plus the regeneration from the fragment of Jellal that was a match for Naruto's own in the other timeline. Made for a potent combination. Honestly, he was super curious to see how it reflected on his status screen and to see if it had actually increased or if it would even show up at all, because when using his Jinchuriki cloak forms, his status screen never reflected that. It was weird. Still so many questions left unanswered about it. Status. He thought, shaking his head. Name. Daiki Yuriai, age, 13, chakra capacity, 170, 000 170, 000 low tier kage, strength, 198 slash, endurance, 275 slash, durability, 197 slash, agility, 197 slash, taijutsu, 205 slash 500, ninjutsu, 290 slash 500, Jinjutsu, 45 slash 500, Bukijutsu, 120 slash 500, Chakra Control, 259 slash 500, Chakra Affinities, Lightning, Advanced Roar with the Power of Thunder, Water, Expert the Sea Parts Before You, Fuinjutsu, Advanced the Breath Hitches, Ha, huh, his chakra capacity had risen nearly 10,000 in the last few days, a decent little jump already from the massive jump he'd gained from his little run-in with Orochimaru. Granted, that wasn't all from the fragment of Jellal, the star chakra, Isabu's chakra and his eyes made sure his chakra capacity was passively growing constantly. And of course he had a bunch of shadow clones training it out right now, which made his chakra capacity grow through training it. Still, even with all that, the growth was noticeable from last night he knew. And beyond that, interestingly, his physical abilities had indeed grown, as had his chakra control apparently. Each had grown by roughly, 
near 20 points each by his estimation after gaining the fragment of Jell. That was great. That was weeks worth of training right there. He was close to breaking 200 on most of his physical abilities and closing in on 300 with endurance. Man, I'm a total beast. Daiki grinned as he stared at the status screen. Eh, getting there I suppose. Give it a few years and I might allow you to claim as so in truth. Isabu piped in. Daiki blinked. And who made you the beast title police? He asked with a snort. I am a tailed beast, remember? It's in the name, right now I'm afraid, Daiki. You can only claim to be a beast by proxy because of me, not of your own merit, too bad, so sad. Isabu replied smugly. You know, you were made out to be the nice polite one of you nine. Daiki replied with a pout. All you do is bully me though. He whined. I am the polite nice one, you already know what head cases my siblings are. Isabu retorted. And I'm just doing my civic duty to deflate that ego a bit here and there before it inflates your head so much you fly off to space. Before Daiki could think of something to fire back with, Isabu coughed. Anyway, it's not just the power of your chakra and abilities that have increased, you probably can't tell yourself right now, but I am chakra itself given form and your chakra is part of your very life force. The three-tailed bijou brought up. And so, what are you getting at? Daiki asked. He already had a pretty good idea, of course, since it was perhaps the main reason he actually went for this fragment of Jell-O, but he couldn't exactly confirm if it was working himself. Isabu apparently could. The energy of Jell-O, it's not quite chakra, it's more akin to the natural energy being absorbed into your heavenly star seal at a rough guess, though I cannot be fully sure on that part until we actually learn how to sense natural energy, Isabu continued. Still, it is incredibly pure and as it increases your chakra, so to does it enhance your life force. Already through since yesterday, I estimate that your max living age has increased by near a year, eight months if I had to narrow it down fully, and will increase by that amount daily so long as that fragment in your seal continues to pass its energy to you. Hmm, that was very good to know. And meant he would recover the lifespan he'd given up with the hero's water. Roughly ten years in just over two weeks. Eight months per day, which would be roughly around between 2,900 and 3,000 in a year, which in months would equate to around 120 years. Ah, a lot different from how it worked in the other timeline. Perhaps a change somehow because this was a different universe, maybe? But then, that didn't really make sense either. The full stone is not without its drawbacks, the pure energy, I theorize gives a mutated form, just like the way the cursed seal does, which is another reason I'm guessing it is akin to natural energy. Isabu already had an answer for that as well apparently. You are not using the full power of the stone, but rather purifying and filtering its energy into your own, gaining only beneficial traits, if at the cost of some instant strength. In this sense, it is more akin to you drawing from that fragment and making your chakra become Jell Chakra itself, a source of its own growing from the ground up. Perhaps in the future your chakra will have innate healing properties to it. That does make sense. After all, I can't feel anything like a transformation coming from my energy. Daiki mused, crossing his arms in thought. And it wouldn't be that hard to draw on and transform if it was anything like the cursed seal. After all, Sasuke could use his level 2 transformation without any training whatsoever just from drawing more on the cursed seal. He wasn't the type to toot his own hoe. Yes you are. Isabu deadpanned. But, he was pretty damn skilled if he did say so himself. And he had Isabu backing him up, between the two of them, if there was a transformation, they'd have found it real quick. Since they hadn't, it made sense Daiki didn't have a transformation coming from the energy. As it should be, the only transformations you need are my forms. Isabu added. Daiki quite agreed with that. Plus, if he transformed into some weird mutated bat or wolf thing, it would make his chakra cloak look way less epic. Hell if he gained fur or something. People probably wouldn't even be able to see the badass tattoos he got from his heavenly star seal. Wait. What about sage mode? Daiki asked. That is less a transformation and more an augmentation of your base form. It gets a pass. Bijou sage mode is definitely something we should acquire in the future if we can. Isabu replied. Phew. Also by the way, your math was totally off. In a year you would accumulate 243 years worth of life force. The huge tortoise Bijou then added on. You should slow down a bit when calculating in your head. Then again, I suppose you even managing simple times tables is a massive feat considering all your brain power revolves around your precious grind and figuring out how to punch harder. Hey! Daiki narrowed his eyes. You can insult me all you want, buddy. I know you love me, really. 
but watch your tone when talking about the most holy lifestyle. Ugh, the worst of it is, you actually do pretty much worship it. Isabu groaned. Kanoha better hope the Sandame Hokage survives this little invasion coming up. Otherwise, they'll find themselves as a whole forced into an all-new religion and possible cult. Daiki opened his mouth to reply, before pausing. Hmm, that's not actually a bad idea. He mused. Isabu shut up instantly. Yeah, yeah, I like it. If I become Hokage, I'll make the grind mandatory for all ninja and ninja in training. Really boost the performance of my ninja minions. Daiki nodded to himself. That way they'll be way more useful in the future instead of just fodder I'll have to waste energy protecting if things spiral into a big old war like they did in the other timeline. I should practice what I preach and watch what I say. Isabu groaned in defeat. Are you quite done? Toka's voice broke him out of his mental conversation. Daiki looked over to the opposite end of the room, where a single bed sat pressed up against the wall and a familiar pink scaled chameleon lay resting atop his pillow in her shrunken form. More or less, he shrugged. He wasn't actually sure why she had stuck around. Generally, whenever she had finished a task for him or finished training with him, she disappeared off back to her homeland. Good, she nodded simply. I must say, watching your face shift through such a variety of ridiculous expressions was rather nauseating. At one point you even had a rather horrid grin on your face that would not look at all out of place on the face of a serial killer. Ouch. I am a serial killer. He deadpanned at her. He'd honestly lost track of how many people he'd killed. But he was betting it was over a hundred by this point at least. Bandits were absolute clowns that never learned. Even when doing minor Dirank missions outside the village, it wasn't that rare to run into a few of them. They were like roaches to be honest, they weren't at all a threat. But just when you think you had stamped them out, a few more popped up out of the tracks and loitered around the forest looking for travelers. Which never really worked out well for them, because they tended to get swatted by any passing shinobi if they came across them. Hmm, slightly true I suppose, though there is a difference, Toka mused lazily. Still, I advise you not to show faces like that around the female population, you will surely be unable to attract a mate while wearing such a ghastly expression. Trust me, I have no problems on that front. Daiki rolled his eyes. Well maybe, granted, he was lacking entirely on the romance front and only had a booty call, and a hot older woman offering to bang him if he did something epic for her. Even Naruto and Sasuke had actual girls interested in romance and a proper relationship and love with them. Gah, how depressing. So, is there a reason you're still hanging around? Daiki asked, shaking his head and putting those thoughts out of mind before he got so depressed he started listening to country ballads and songs about heartbreak, then busted out the tubs of ice cream. Is it a problem for you that I'm still here? Toka asked instead of answering the question. Nah, I like having you around despite how much of a biatch you are to me, he shrugged. Just curious since you tend to split when you feel like you've done what you needed to. Perhaps I wouldn't be so much of a biatch, as you so crudely put it, if you were not such an incompetent muscle head. Toka rolled her ringed eyes. As for why I am here, I have no duties currently within the clan and have some free time, and soon you shall be participating in a competitive bout, no? I thought to stay around and see the great Chameleon Clan's chosen summoner show his power off to others for a bit and enjoy myself. Also, she added before he could say anything else and narrowed her eyes at him seriously. You had a run-in with the main summoner and contract holder of the Snake Clan. Father wishes to keep an eye on the situation, just in case Grandfather is brought into battle against you. Huh, that was right, wasn't it? Manda was actually her grandfather. Honestly, it was quite the pedigree. The daughter of the one who would become one of Payne's main summons and the granddaughter of the personal summon beast of the snake Sanin. Fair enough. Feel free to stick around as long as you want. Daiki shrugged. Personally, he wasn't all that fussed about the snake summons. Chameleons were clearly superior. Actually, that reminds me. I gave another search mission to your clan to find something for me near two days ago. How is that dash... The Uchiha corpse, yes? Toka cut him off. We already found it. You already had the location for it after all. We have been keeping a hold of it for now since you were busy, and we did not want to just leave it at your estate. Daiki's eyes widened. You found it? He gasped, a massive grin spreading across his face. Chameleons seriously were the best, no doubt. Yes, though it is in a very poor state. Toka shrugged her scaly shoulders. It hasn't decomposed too much. 
but it has been partially eaten by the aquatic wildlife within the Naka River, and what is left of the corpse is quite waterlogged, and beyond that, it lacks eyes as well. I have no idea why you wanted it to be honest. Without the Sharingan the corpse of an Uchiha is rather useless. You let me worry about that? Daiki waved her off. Can you bring it here? I suppose. Give me a moment. Toka agreed, and a second later, disappeared in a puff of smoke. Daiki wasn't waiting long. A mere minute at most passed before another puff of smoke signified the return of Toka. She was prudent like that. When the smoke dissipated, it was to show Toka still in her miniature form, standing beside a bloated, soaking piece of flab. Daiki grimaced. For all intents and purposes, Shursue Uchiha had been a pretty handsome guy. From what he remembered, he had the pretty boy looks of a typical Uchiha, yet at the same time, his features were more masculine than say Sasuke. Now he, or rather was was left of him, looked more like a fat, bloated tumor of skin that seemed to leak a disgusting watery substance from each and every pore. And that wasn't even getting into the fact that there were tons of great big rents in the body all over the surface, as if tons of creatures had taken to nibbling on it from time to time. It was a wonder it hadn't just become a skeleton at this point. But then, Shursue was just built different from your typical person, he was near an S-class shinobi when he died. His body was just that much tougher than an average person, that it was taking longer for his body to decay. Still, it wasn't exactly a pretty sight, and it was a horrible look for such a cool guy. I still do not understand what good this body will do you, Toka mused, casting it an indifferent glance. Unless you've went all mad scientist like the snake contract holder and plan to clone this Uchiha. No, nothing like that, Daiki replied, eyes on the corpse. His scarlet red eyes glowed and he looked into the body itself taking in the contents of it. Damn, it wasn't half waterlogged now, was it? That would have to go. Do you remember what I told you about my infinite armor? He asked, crouching down over the body and pressing his hand over it. He focused, spreading his chakra through the body and drew the water within the corpse to it. He'd already long since learned what he needed to do when using raw life force to repair a body. The contents of those four clowns' technique to revive their master Simi, had been explained to him from his loot. In the process of regenerating the body, it would flush out all impurities that had taken root, including the likes of insects and such that had infested the body. Still, there had to be a dozen gallons of water stuffed inside this corpse. Eesh, it was a wonder it hadn't just popped. But then he could attribute that to Shursue's strength before death as well he supposed. Just in case he'd draw the water out. Yes, absorbing chakra and converting it into life force, how could I forget when it has such a silly name? Toka snorted and rolled her ringed eyes, then walked over to hop up onto his shoulder and lay down, observing what he was doing. Yeah! Daiki grinned faintly as he guided the water in the corpse up and out of one of the great big rents in the corpse's flesh. While I lack the revival jutsu itself that will pull a soul from the afterlife, using life force, I can do what they wanted and way better than those guys thanks to my eyes. In fact, the jutsu used for the life force transference itself wasn't really a jutsu, but rather just a function of the infinite armor. A seal. A seal he'd long since cracked. Knew the functions of and could do better with his eyes. Especially in conjunction with perhaps his most used jutsu of all. And what was it they hoped to accomplish, hmm? Toka asked. Some form of revival jutsu? Like your village's Edo Tensei? Figures you guys would know about that as well. Daiki snorted. But yeah, along those lines, basically, with enough life force, it's possible to regenerate a corpse that is little more than a skeleton, back to perfectly healthy and alive. I see, Toka said simply and nothing else. Ever the composed lizard lady. Huh? She was silent for a moment as he worked, digesting what he said before. You wish to regenerate the Sharingan and take it for your own, then? Toka questioned a moment later hitting the nail right on the head. Pretty much. Daiki nodded. Hmm, the Sharingan is a powerful tool for sure, but why? Do you plan to replace those eyes you have now, the Shinkigen you call them? She asked next. I would advise against it. The overall abilities, especially the sensory linked ones and the fact they enhance your analytical ability outweigh the benefits of the Sharingan in my opinion. Don't worry. I'm not giving up the Shinkigen. It's way better than the Sharingan. Daiki assured her. 
I simply plan to fuse the Sharingan with my Shinkigen with Fuinjutsu. I just haven't gotten around to making the seal yet. It hadn't exactly been a top priority so far. He already had a rough idea how he would do it mind you, with the four symbol seal, the chakra filter seal and some of the applications of his improved heavenly star seal. Hmm. And how will you go about that I wonder? Toka hummed. And in his peripheral vision he saw her lips stretch into a taunting grin. Do you plan to pull out your eyes to physically inscribe the seals on them? Daiki said nothing. Toka's eyes widened. Truly? She gasped, before erupting into laughter. My goodness, you are truly a buffoon that will do anything to grow stronger. Though an amusing buffoon at least. Daiki resisted the urge to tell her that there was a fine line between something being stupid and something being genius. It was whether it worked or not. But he would just let his work be all the proof he needed and show her. Later when he actually got it done. Still, he did toy with the idea of making a seal around his eyes connecting to his temples rather than the eyes themselves. But, he figured that would weaken the connection and it would be stronger if he fused them together. And actually could lead to a better result. If he sealed the finished product to his genome, making it truly part of his bloodline and able to be passed down. That was something that would take a lot longer to complete though. He wasn't quite good enough to pull something like that yet. He shook his head as the last droplet of water came free, swerving up to join the rest, forming into a large sphere of water nearly as tall as he was that was idly floating in the air under his control. He was really getting good at the water manipulation these days, improving every day, every second even considering he had clones training with it right this very moment. Right, let's get this show on the road then, Daiki said a few moments later, after dumping the water down the plug hole of the shower provided to his room, once again crouching down over the body, which was now while still a lump piece of meat, now much slimmer. He made a single hand seal, mystical palm jutsu. He intoned, familiar warm green healing chakra forming around his hands. And then he focused and drew upon the massive quantities of life force stored within the infinite armor. Beyond absorbing any chakra going his way, Isabu was constantly adding chakra to it himself. And by his counting in sheer volume, they had stored enough chakra to rival that of his two-tailed sibling, Matatabi. His eyes began glowing. So bright the room was cast in a deep red glow, and he molded the life force into his hands. The soft warm green aura of his mystical palm jutsu turned a pure gleaming sliver, and he pressed his hands down atop Shursue's body and let loose, directing the pure healing life force into the corpse. And instantly, before his very eyes, he watched as time itself seemed to rewind rapidly for the body. The bloated skin shrinking, tightening, going from soggy pale gray to warm creamy skin. The rents all over the body healed, filling in, teeth reformed, the bloated skull and face shrunk and molded back into proper shape. A handsome black-haired teen just a few years older than Daiki staring back at him with empty eye sockets. By his counting, he'd already directed a tenth of the total gathered life force, amplified by his eyes and the mystical palm jutsu into the body. What the? Keep going. Isabu urged him before he could falter. Power requires power and the Sharingan, especially these ones, isn't so easily restored from nothing, especially considering these ones' eyes still exist. That didn't make sense at all. Isabu was sure for instance Daiki himself could regenerate a lost lung rather easily. So would that mean if somebody just tore his lung out, and kept it in their hand and didn't destroy it, it would make it harder for Daiki to regenerate? Just keep going, I admit, I do not know everything, but eyes such as these are special, they require you to go further. Isabu replied, how cryptic, and stupid. Really, what was up with the mystery vibes around the Sharingan that even the laws of the universe apparently made it harder to regenerate them just because he pushed even more life force into Shursue's body. Yet still, nothing formed in his eyes. He tripled the output. Soon he'd expanded life force equal to Shikaku the one-tailed bijou in chakra by Isabu's estimates, which had been enough to fully revive Simi and pull him from the afterlife. There, there was a glimmer within eye sockets, small white flakes forming over the optic nerves within. Aura! Daiki roared and went full in. He pushed every little bit of life force stored within the infinite armor out, amplified it by his eyes and directed it into the body with the mystical palm jutsu. And then he went a step further and went even further beyond. 
He drew on his own chakra, converting almost the entirety of his own chakra capacity into life force and added it on, chakra comparable to that of a Kage converted into life force just to top it off. He was using so much chakra, his own and beyond, spots started dancing in his vision and he began teetering from side to side almost drunkenly. And then all of a sudden, the flow cut off entirely. There was nothing else left beyond his very own life force and Daiki found himself toppling backwards in a dead faint. Chakra exhaustion? He realized blearily. The back of his head smashed into the hard tile floor of the room. Yet Daiki didn't even have the strength left to wince. Toka of course easily and casually left off of his shoulder before he hit the ground. Not even bothering to stop him. Truly a buffoon. She snorted while he lay there and stared up at the ceiling, or rather as much of the ceiling as he could see since most of his vision was filled with spots and blotting most of it out of view. A competent buffoon I suppose though, it seems your efforts were not in vain. Daiki gave a slow blink. Did it work? He thought hazily. A second later, the numbness that had befell his body began to fade away as a familiar dense, powerful chakra flowed into his coils, rejuvenating him giving him strength enough to push himself up to his hands and knees. His limbs still shook mightily with the struggle of it, and even with Isabu it would take a little bit before the effects of chakra exhaustion totally faded, but he for now he could move. He turned his head and looked at the corpse, and a grin began to spread across his face. The perfectly restored body of Shursway Uchiha lay staring up at the ceiling just like he had been before, eyes wide open, Crimson red Sharingan eyes with three Tomo gazing blankly upwards. He has done it. <clears throat> and all it took was chakra comparable to the two-tailed Bijou, amplified by a Dejitsu of his own. Daiki grinned in victory, before collapsing backwards again onto the ground and just laying there, basking at the moment. Never again. He vowed. Well, I wouldn't say never, it may be possible to make an eternal Manjiku Sharingan if you have two pairs of the same set of eyes. Isabu interjected. But I do believe it will be a long time coming. The amount of life force you used for this would truly come in handy in a pinch if we were ever in over our heads. As it is, it will take us months to gain that amount of chakra again, and that is assuming we do not get into any battles that force me to exhaust my chakra to keep us alive in the meantime. Daiki grimaced. Yeah, he hadn't at all thought it would take that much life force to just regenerate Shursue's body. Not even close. For reference, that amount of chakra turned into life force was easily enough for you to live a thousand years lifespan wise. Isabu added, Daiki had forgotten how much it truly sucked to have chakra exhaustion. Even before he slurped up Isabu into his chest like a big wet tortoise flavored noodle, he'd been very careful to train himself just to before the point of chakra exhaustion and never fall past the line. After all, if he had chakra exhaustion, he would be laid up recovering for ages and thus would lose precious time that could other be spent grinding for gains. As it was, even with Isabu's chakra running through his veins, allowing him to move, he still felt lightheaded and his limbs heavier than the weights he wore. Which were 20,000 pounds by the way. Which was like 10 tons or so. His limbs literally felt heavier than that. He practically had to drag himself in an army crawl over to Shursue's corpse. Toka laughing all the way at him as she hopped up onto the bed he'd left out. She really did find a lot of amusement in bullying him. That wasn't fair at all by the way. I'm not a nerd. He whined mentally. He was big, tough and muscular. He could lift a grown man with a single pinky finger. He was manly with a capital M. As it was, he sealed Shursue's corpse into his dimension force seal before flopping onto his back and just laying there. Can you help me up onto the bed? Daiki asked his bully lizard. No. Toka snorted. Think of this as a lesson to think things through more carefully you silly meathead buffoon. Daiki pouted. Well whatever, it wasn't like he couldn't really do it if he wanted to. He just couldn't be bothered. Another unfortunate side effect of chakra exhaustion. Lethargy and lack of motivation. It was truly the antithesis to the grind. Only heretics to the grind like Kakashi fondly fornicated with chakra exhaustion. And that guy got chakra exhaustion a lot in the other timeline. He'd recover faster of course if he could stop using his eyes. Sadly for him, unlike chakra exhaustion's personal gigolo Kakashi, just covering his eyes didn't exactly stop them from working. Still, it wouldn't take him that long to recover. 
an hour or two at best thanks to not only Isabu, but the chakra being constantly fed into his coils by the heavenly star seal. He would just have to tough it out until then. He apologized mentally to the grind. No wait, he took that back. This is an opportunity to grind resistance to chakra exhaustion. Daiki realized, now that he was exposed to it, if this ever somehow happened again, he would be more used to it. By the way, you have a visitor, Toka commented. So I'll leave you to that and have a nap for now I believe human beds aren't too bad. She said and then faded out of view entirely. Though he knew she was still there of course. And just as she did, there was a knock on his door. Ah, she was right. Damn it, he hadn't sensed anyone approaching at all. Sure, his senses were dulled right now but still. I've got a long way to go before I catch up to her sensory abilities. He grimaced. Well, whatever. He'd just need to grind that out more later. Come in. Daiki called out. It's open. He'd get up and open it himself, but he was feeling rather lazy. The door swung open and Daiki blinked as he found himself looking at a familiar bun-haired older girl. Huh, they had finished the exam already? Did that mean the sound trio had attacked Team 7 already? He wondered if they did better this time around. Sup? Daiki greeted the girl, plastering a debonair smile across his face. Tenten raised an eyebrow at him. What are you doing? She asked dryly. Just chillaxing like a baller. Daiki replied and would have casually shrugged. If he currently had the motivation to do so, her other eyebrow rose up and joined the first. Somehow, knowing you, I doubt that. Do you even know the definition of chilling out? Or is this just some new way of training? You've discovered? The bun-haired girl asked with a snort and crossed her arms. I'm training to resist chakra exhaustion. He tried. Tenten stared blankly at him for a second before sighing and kicking the door shut behind her. You mean you did something stupid and exhausted all your chakra and now can't move? She sliced right through his bullcrap, walking over and crouching next to his head. Why do you assume it was something stupid and not intentional? Daiki dug his feet in. Metaphorically, since you know, chakra exhaustion and all. Because we've hung out a decent little bit now, spent a decent amount of time together with that date we were on and all, and I've managed to get a decent grasp on you, I think. Ten Ten smirked at him and poked his cheek, daring him to bat her hand away. He of course could, he just didn't do so. Because he liked the feel of her finger, yeah, totally. The first time we met at that restaurant I thought you were cool, but you're almost as big an idiot as Lee and Gai Sensei. Hey, now that's uncalled for. Daiki protested. I'm cool. You look cool. There's a big difference. Ten Ten denied his protests. You're actually a dork and a pervy one at that. Pervy dork? Did someone else hear glass shattering? No? So it was just his pride then? If he had the motivation for it right now, he would have slumped over in depression. The illusion of his pride had been destroyed, completely shattered as if some spiky-haired delinquent had punched right through it. His cool image, the badass front he put up to show his greatness. It was all for nothing? I've been telling you that for a while now, you know? Isabu huffed. Yes, but he thought Isabu was just yanking his chain. So, what really happened? Tenten asked, breaking him from his thoughts. And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much, and it keeps me going, plus it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.